All right, sergeants, if you can begin your recordings. PC started. According to the cloud, all set. Okay, let's back up is rolling. Excellent. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Contracts. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please silence your electronic devices. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at, council, at testimony, testimony at council nyc.gov. Once again, that email address is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Good morning and welcome to this virtual hearing of the New York City Council's Committee on Contracts. My name is Ben Kalos and I am chair of the committee. For those of you who are watching remotely, please feel free to participate in this hearing by tweeting me at Ben Kalos. Uh, before I dive in, I'd like to recognize my fellow colleagues on this committee. We are joined by Council Member Bill Perkins, Council Member Inez Barron, Council Member Mark Jonai. As we know, the COVID-19 pandemic has wreaked havoc on the city. In addition to the health and economic crisis, it's caused that it has also decimated our city's budget. And in order to close a nearly $5 billion budget gap, uh, Mayor de Blasio has called for uh, a lot of different cost savings measures, uh, quote unquote. One such measure includes finding savings through reducing the city's workforce. The city has already shed 7,000 positions through attrition and the mayor is aiming for an additional 5,000 city workers. The mayor's announced a three to one hiring freeze, meaning for every three vacancies, the city will only hire one replacement. Now I understand that there needs to be savings made to the city budget, especially at this critical point in time, but I question the actual value of these quote unquote labor savings that they will provide. While the fiscal 2022 preliminary plan that the mayor just put forward projects attrition will save the city around $350 million uh, over this past fiscal year and the next fiscal year, New Yorkers are relying more than ever on city services. All told, the mayor is also proposing another billion dollars in cuts that he is seeking to make, uh, seeking to take from our city's employees, some of whom are paid near poverty wages. We've already seen lines around the block at food pantries and the need for housing for support, medical assistance, uh, food assistance in the form of SNAP and other assistance programs only expected to grow as this pandemic lingers. I'm concerned that reducing the number of city workers will have a severe negative impact on New Yorkers trying to get the support they need and deserve. While the mayor has focused on reducing costs arising from city workers, taking a deep dive into the city's contracts. What's clear to me is that the city still has plenty of money to outsource work and provide hefty overhead profits to our nation's largest corporations whose billionaire CEOs have only gotten wealthier since the pandemic. When I got elected in 2013, our contracts budget was $9 billion. Today, it's over $17 billion. During budget negotiations, I proposed $15 billion in cost savings, including cuts to contracts where we are paying consultants two, three, even four times more than city employees with the exact same titles. Local Law 63 exists to bring transparency to the city's contracting process to ensure that if the city has no other option but to outsource jobs, that we actually generate real savings for taxpayers. The purpose of law is to clearly show that if the city decides to contract for services and if city workers are displaced because of this contracting, then there should actually be a savings and uh, that we actually do a cost benefit analysis. Now I've looked through a number of RFPs, requests for proposals, and honestly, I don't see the city demonstrating the fiscal benefit of outsourcing work rather than relying on city employees. Maybe it's because of how obscure the budget process is, which doesn't reflect exactly where cuts, especially the headcounts are occurring. Maybe it's because of some of the uh, requirements of Local Law 63 that are being honored almost in the breach in a pro forma way, whether it's a sentence that just says there won't be displacement, which is clearly not in compliance, or just a check mark sheet that people have where they just 
check a bunch of boxes to get around having to do the cost benefit analysis. Either way, we're clearly unable to achieve the goals intended by the law, and that's why I'm convening today's hearing. Um, we'll be starting with uh, some of our brothers and sisters from our municipal uh, labor unions, uh, particularly DC 37, and ask me. I want to thank them because they've been blowing the whistle on this issue for as long as I've been an elected official. One of the reasons I was interested in becoming chair of the contracts committee is to take this very issue on. Uh, as a person who has worked in the private sector, I've always found that the best way to save money on a budget is to bring as much work in-house and avoid paying somebody else's profits. Uh, we will also be joined today by the administration. Uh, particularly, we'll be hearing from the uh, Parks Department, uh, where we've had a previous hearing uh, relating to uh, the length of time and capital contracts. And we've made some discoveries relating to headcount and uh, the contractors being used to get Parks capital contracts done. We also uh, are joined by uh, DCAS, which manages our fleet. Uh, and uh, we are grateful to have them here. Uh, we'll be hearing from uh, President Joe Paleo, who has some uh, information to share about our fleet services. Before I invite our brothers and sisters to testify, I'd like to give a take a moment to thank my contracts committee staff, Legislative Council Alex Polinoff, who's now on paternity leave of which I couldn't be prouder. And I believe every single city employee should have paternity leave and family leave, uh, whether it's for a new baby or for caring for a loved one. Acting Legislative Counsel, Josh Kingsley, Policy Analyst, Leah Skripiak, uh, Finance Unit Head, John Russell, and Financial Analyst, Frank Sarno, for all their hard work in putting this hearing together. Uh, and just checking to see if we've got any more folks from the committee to join us. Uh, Seeing none, I will now turn it over to the moderator, Committee Council Josh Kingsley, to go over some procedural items. Thank you, Chair Kalos. I'm Josh Kingsley, Counsel to the Contracts Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen to your name to be called. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to 15 minutes, which includes time it takes for the panelists to answer your questions. Please note that for the ease of the virtual hearing, there will not be a second round of questioning outside of questioning from the committee chair. All participants, again, should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. So the first panelist to give testimony, as council member Kalos indicated, um, are representatives from uh, labor unions. Uh, we have Henry Garrido, executive director of District Council 37. Uh, followed by Laura Moran, president of Local 2627, uh, followed by Joe Puglio, president of Ask Me Local 983, and then if he's joining us, Anthony Wells, who's president of SEIU Local 37, or 371. Uh, Y'all may begin, I, uh, uh, Executive Director Garrido, uh, go ahead. Good morning, uh, Chair Kalos, Council Everyone, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Chair Kellos, for uh, convening this meeting, this important meeting. I, I want to start by sending a shout out to Sergeant Martinez. It's good to see you, brother. Um, uh, as well as my fellow council members, uh, um, my the colleagues, your colleagues, I should say, Council Member Barons, Perkins, and Joe Knight. It's good to see you all. Um, they, they're there's, there's one thing I like to start with in this idea is I remember very distinctly when the indictments came from the city time uh, scandal, which to red date remains the largest municipal scandal in the history of any city where the contractor stole over $600 million that I had to repay back to the city. I remember very distinctly uh, folks saying uh, on the city side, well, we didn't know. We did not know, we did not, we know. I mean, for a period of time, that was the excuse. Now we knew that uh, from the beginning, right? The city workers that we represent, which has a, a, a total of 150,000 city workers have been providing frontline services um, and it's uh, continuing to make the city run. You in this process of the city time scandal, I remember distinctly how many times city workers uh, where hearings like this one, uh, probably personally, blowing the whistle and saying, 
There is corruption in city government and particularly on the contract. They're killing us, right? They're outsourcing our jobs for pay that it requires more uh, and we need to do something about it. And city officials just merely dismissing it to say, that's just a part of government, right? We do procurement as we do uh, purchasing of vehicles, as we do everything else until it was time to become a scandal. Um, the result of that was the spark of a conversation between the unions, the public, um, uh, that raised the issue and gave birth to Local Law 63. Now, let me be very clear. Local Law 63 was never intended to protect city workers first. It was protected, it was intended to protect taxpayers first by basically defining the conditions by which the city could uh, procure it. Uh, and, and uh, let contractors come in to do services that are otherwise necessary in the city. I say that because there are times where, you know, this discussion turns into the city unions are fighting to preserve the jobs at a time where economic downturn is there. And where we are, and we're proud of it, and I make no excuse of it, but we are fighting to also save the taxpayers dollars. And that is an important component of this because when we define Local Law 63, um, we understood that there was a history prior to Local Law 63 that involved Local Law 35, which created a similar provision of displacement uh, and a similar requirement of cost analysis. Local Law 35, which had been in place, and I remember Council Member Perkins on the first time around was participating, so it's good to see him there. In the discussion of what happens when uh, a city worker is likely to lose the job as a result of outsourcing of the job of, of, uh, by the city of New York, it requires a comparative cost analysis if displacement of a determination of displacement must, is done at the beginning of the contract. That was the law then, it is the law now. What we did in Local Law 63 with the discussion of the then speaker and some of the council similar to the ones that you have here was to further this, define what displacement meant. And I, I wanna talk about displacement because I think it's at the core of the issue. Displacement under the law is defined by the, a reduction on the, and this is a quote directly from the law, a reduction in the number of funded positions included but not limited to the resulting of attrition, layoff, the motions, bumping, involuntary transfers to a new class, title or location, time-based reductions or reductions in the customary uh, hours of work, wages, benefits of any city employees, end quote. That's on the law. And it took weeks for us to negotiate the language because we had experienced that agencies time and again were simply making a check mark on the procurement process by saying that no displacement was taking place. When you have an agency where you had 100 workers and now you have 50 and you had 20 consultants and now you have 100 consultants, it doesn't take a genius to figure out who's doing the work. So all we said was, well, why don't we require the agency that if such displacement was going to take effect to do a comparative cost analysis. In our experience, we have found computer consultants we're costing the city an average of $250,000 at a most basic level, help desk and, and things of that nature. At a higher level, uh, where we we're talking about system integration, we're talking about closer to a half a million dollars per person. So even if you included pensions, even if you included healthcare, it was costing the city more. So it made no sense to us that the agencies that were strapped for funding were procuring services for contractors that are costing them twice as much as some of the city workers, particularly on the IT set. When we had com conversations with commissioners, they said to us, well, look, Henry, I wanna hire some of the city workers. In fact, I did civil service tests. I know I have to comply with the law, but city hall, OMB, is telling me that I can't. But on the other hand, my OTPS budget, other than personnel services budget is free to do what I then please with it, excuse my language, because that's the kind of travesty it is. If we don't have money to hire city workers, why do we have money to hire consultants? 
and pay them twice as much. And, and so I, I present to you that when the mayor of the city of New York last year pres, uh, put the unions um, in, on notice that says that if I don't get a billion dollars of labor savings, I'm gonna lay off 22,000 city workers. That by itself should have triggered an anti-displacement required on the local law 63. Now, ultimately we were able to come up with a, an agreement that saved the workers that gave the city savings, substantial savings to the tune of $164 million in order to not lay off the 22,000, at least the, the portion of the 22,000 that were DC 37 members. Every union came through and did a similar agreement that gave the city sufficient amount of money not to have to save city workers. That agreement ends on June 30th. And uh, unless we get some $5 billion in federal aid, the problem is this, if the city is doesn't have money, as I said before, to hire a city workers, how does it have money to hire consultants? Case in point, two days ago, we saw the uh, Human Resources Administration post solicitations at one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning for services of consultants that they bypassed the regular procurement. No cost analysis was done no notification to the union or the city council who approves this budget on their intent to outsource uh, and continue to outsource the work of um, the processing of welfare to work recipients, of Medicaid services, and on the kiosk. These are all requirements by law and they have made a mockery of both the city council and the public by having a process that bypasses every single check balances to bypass the procurement. They did it as an inter-government contract process for a contract that they use at the state that the state terminated five years ago. So I am baffled that HRA has been allowed to do this, but this isn't the only example of egregious violation. I mentioned city time, I mentioned the, the problems we have with city win, and we mentioned the time about the failures of the 911 system that proved that uh, not only cost is an issue, but also disruption of services. And one of the areas that we said when the inset of the law, Mr. Chair, was simply this. City workers are accountable. They're fingerprinted, their background checked. They are checked to make sure that they can do the job. If they get arrested for doing some malfeasance, the system already flags them and removes them until an investigation is done. We have a process here where we have thousands of contractors in the city of New York that are not accountable to anyone, that are not background checked and not check and not and are and having access to sensitive information of city workers. I use the example for instance of the fire department that has now hired cons uh, uh, temps to do the evaluation for 911 victims, meaning workers who are victims of 911 who are suffering um, PTSD and other um, evaluations who are applying for either unlimited sick time or applying for evaluations as a result of their suffering through 911 are being done by contractors who are evaluating city workers, evaluating the medical condition, evaluating the backgrounds to make determination whether those people are eligible for. These individuals themselves have not been background checked. And I, I am concerned about the access to sensitive personal medical individual information by a workforce that I call the parallel workforce, unelected, unchecked, and uh, not background checked to be able to access. And to me, that's one of the biggest tragedies, travesty. Let me start, let me close with this, Mr. Chair. Uh, you have been a leader in talking about computer consultants in the city of New York and how um, uh, in many instances, those computer consultants take away jobs to the people in our community. Uh, why do we need to go and bring a contractor from all over the world to do a job that uh, somebody here in Brooklyn or in Queens or in the Bronx could do. Some of our uh, kids that are graduating for CUNY have no access to those jobs. That's what the civil service system was supposed to do. 
was to provide an even playing field so people can compete for those jobs and provide services to the city in spite of who they knew and uh, the nepotism that we know occurs in city government. That's what the civil service was created for. And what the city has done is made a mockery of the history of the corruption we saw through Tammany Hall by allowing a bypass of that process in hiring people as consultants and contractors to do the job for the city, unelected, on background check, and for twice the cost. So I raise this question to you, Mr. Chair, and to your fellow uh, members of the city council. The mayor has announced that he would do a one to three uh, hiring back of attrition because the city has no money. We know the financial woes of the city of New York are not, we're not here to dispute it. Is there such a same reduction to the contract employees? Are we doing the same that we, um, to analyze the 17,000 contracts that we talked about? The $17 billion, I'm sorry, of contracting budget that we have. In the past, there have been measures that have been done in terms of reducing costs around contracting out. Are we doing the same? Are we holding the contractors to the same standard? I, I clarify that we are our very own city workers. You know, this pandemic proved the value again of a city employee. We lost 163 DC 37 members through COVID-19 and more are coming right now. I have several of them that are sick, that are intubated, that are in a coma right now. City workers who sacrifice themselves, their safety, their safety of their families to go in and provide services day in and day out when people were going out uh, in order to provide services to those who were sick, who needed services. Where were the contractors then? You know where they were? They were home collecting the paychecks. So is it fair to the heroes to sacrifice themselves who died to now be rewarded by not only the threat of a layoff, but also to see a contractor who never showed up to get the contract to some of them are doing the work from Florida remotely and getting paid right here, not adding to our tax base and not adding to all the benefits. Is it fair? And I leave you with that, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much for listening. And thank you for my colleagues uh, in the unions who are participating in the hearing, looking forward to any questions you might have. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, um, uh, Executive Director Grito, do you have any time constraints? Or are we able to uh, continue with the rest of the panel before we open to questions? Not at all. I'm here for this. This is really important. OK. I'd like to acknowledge you've been joined by council member Helen Rosenthal. We've now been joined by uh, Anthony, Pre President Anthony Wells, and we will turn it over to him next. Good morning. Thank you, Chair. And thank you for, thank you to, your, to all the council members on this hearing. And thank you to my, my leader, my executive director. I think he's laid it out pretty well. Uh, we do have to look at the relationship that, that the city has with contractors. Clearly, our workers are doing better, and it's not just in technology. There are contracts all over the place. There are, there are contracts in child welfare outside of the normal, of, no, of the normal work, of the normal relationships that the city has. is is unconscionable, as Henry said, to talk about laying off workers while you have all these contracts with these exorbitant cost on them, the work that can be done in-house. We also need to pay attention to what's going on in NYCHA in terms of contracting out. There are programs that, that are aimed at getting young people in city in city government. So as we look at, at, this, at this relationship between the city and these contractors, you got to examine it in the context of where can real savings be had. And there's a difference. A civil servant, folks, has more, first of all, it's more accountable. And they usually dedicate their life to this. You know, people get jobs and them jobs become careers. And they have a dedication to the citizens of New York that is not temporary, that is long-term, that contractors cannot give you. So, so you know, I, I, I don't really have to add a lot to what, what Hemi, Hemi has laid out. This is very important to us, not just in this pandemic. The city has done some work of insourcing under Henry Garrido. Uh, you know, he's had some great conversations and some great successes. We're getting some of the work contracted back in. 
But in this time of crisis, and as he said, our members on the front line, you know, oftentimes front line workers are identified in the smaller chasm, which it, which, which it should be. But there are front line workers who are servicing the citizens of New York in these job centers in juvenile facilities, in hospitals. They're not doctors and not EMS, but the city services are continuing because these workers, as Henry said, have risked their lives by going to work and servicing the citizens of New York every day during this crisis. This is not a, a, a us against them issue. This is an issue by one, how do we become more efficient in city government? How do we e e erase waste? How do we make sure that the people who are given the services are also secure in their family and the ability to feed their family? So I thank you, Chair, Chair, Chair Carlos. I thank you, all, all city council people. We have done well together in this, in this pandemic, but we can do better. And as we plan for going forward, we need to, we need to have an idea of how we could in, in, ensure that these everyday heroes, from cops, firemen, to custodians, to teachers, to child welfare workers who've done this work, have the ability to put food in their families' tables while we while we create a new world. Because there's no going back to what was. We have to create what is. Thank you for the time. Thank you, council members. And thank you, Henry. President Laura Morand. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. Um, Happy New Year. And um, I want to thank you for this opportunity for me to present my thoughts and, and things that my members have brought to my attention on consultants. Consultants have, ever since I've worked for the cities, for the city of New York, the fire department, and, and now as president, I'm hearing from other members to um, <clears throat> that the bruises that are going on that management is doing in, or, in order to hire consultants. There is a, they do it to displace and to avoid utilizing civil service system because a lot of the managers, they hire their friends and cronies to, um, for these jobs and they don't, a lot of them don't know how to utilize the civil service system and they want to avoid it because they don't understand it and they don't, are not willing to learn it. This management definitely needs to be trained on how to better utilize the system because it's definitely cheaper than hiring consultants. Consultants tend to uh, much, are paid much more than my members are paid. In fact, my members are training consultants. How is it that a consultant is hired and don't know how to do the job or they have very little qualifications and then they have to turn around and train these consultants to do the jobs. I know for a fact that FDNY Help Desk has been outsourced since before 2002 when I started working for the city and it continues to be outsourced. And the consultants who worked on the help desk make more than if they were to hire a computer aide or a computer, um, or a, <clears throat> a computer um, associate to do that job. A computer service technician is paid on average 60,000, whereas those consultants who are working at the help desk are making over 90,000. So, and how is the um, FDNY allowed to keep continuously renew that contract? That should be an entry level job for a college student to do help desk. So, but yet they have people who've been doing help desk at FDNY for over 15 years, if not longer. They, um, <clears throat> excuse me. I know for a fact that HRA is using capital projects um, in order to avoid having to ask, quite answer questions about displacement, which so that they can avoid having to um, be forced to hire a civil servant, which will be a member who will, who would be have a vested interest in what the, in the um, future of the city instead of just getting whatever they can out of it uh, and moving on or just sitting and milking it for what it's worth. 22 century consultant collects over 10% of, of their consultant salary and those consultants get little to no benefits. And <clears throat> Prutech is the, um, currently the um, help desk that's being um, the company that's being outsourced to handle the help desk at FDNY. And like I said, a lot of times my members are the ones who have to train them how to do their job and show them how to use the programs and so forth. And another thing that we see is the city is paying for these consultants to be trained, not just by city workers, but when they have companies come in to do training or they send, they also send consultants out for training that my members don't get. 
A lot of times my members don't even, they don't even know that training is available to them to improve their skills. That's why our local offer training and DC 37 offer trainings because a lot of my members can't get training through no other means, but yet consultants are sitting in training classes that the city is paying for that my members should be sitting in. <clears throat> And also another thing we come to understand, um, we come to learn is that um, consultants, their background checks are not good. We I've known of a couple of instances that a consultant was hired, it had a criminal, it had a violent criminal background that never that did not come to light until after he had threatened several employees, including a couple of my members. And then it was at that point in time that the, uh, that the consultant company did a more thorough background and pulled that consultant. But that consultant was there for over a year and allowed to do Lord knows what, because they get all kinds of access. They get access to certain files that even city, that, <clears throat> that city employees don't always get access to. And my members go through a 10 year background check when they're hired off the civil service list, but these consultants don't go through that. And the 10 year background check is not done by the agency, it's done by DOI, Department of Investigation, which is very thorough. And then they would not hire a person who is unqualified or had a violent background, but yet consultants are slipping in on, under the cracks and having ac access to very sensitive data. And then I know for a fact there's been contracts that some management have vested interest in that they own, they secretly own interest in consulting companies that they're pushing to work for the city, which is, is double dipping, is unfair, is a conflict of interest, but there's no, there's no looking into that. So it's definitely these, um, a lot of these contracts are failing because management has um, a vested interest in it and it's a, and it's a conflict and they looking to get some pat their own pocket. So it's a lot of corruption in that. So <clears throat> I do know of, um, there's a high percentage of IT contracts that fail. The, um, <clears throat> this FDNY tried multiple times to get rid of their mainframe system for the, um, not for the, not for the, um, for the EMS CAD and the fire CAD, and they have yet to succeed in being able to get rid of those old antiquated systems and update it because the contracts, there's, we see these companies come in and put in, put in these bids and they, they milk as much money out of it. And the contract, whatever they provide is woefully, it does not meet with the guidelines or the um, milestones, and they are not, they do not hit all the priorities that the contract is supposed to meet. And therefore the money is, a lot of money is wasted on the project, um, whatever's left is not what the agency needed, not what management needed, not what the members, not what the employees or the city workers need. It's always something that's less, far less than what was needed. And, I'm, and my members are capable of doing a much better job than most of these consultants. The city claims that all oh, that manage, that they, that there's, the work they need, my members can't do, which is not true. I have members who have PhDs. I have, a lot of my members have master's degree. A lot of my members, they go and they are anxious to get training. They, we're paying for training. Like I said, we reimburse them for certifications because the city is not willing to pay to train them. They, wanna, they, um, they don't wanna deal with the civil services. They don't wanna educate themselves on learning how to navigate it, which is the best way because at least you hire people who care and work and live in the community who have a vested interest, who will be there to support these systems once it's done, once the, once the, once it's rolled out and they're there to maintain it, not to have a consultant come in, do whatever they do, and then hand it off to a city worker. And then the city worker got to fix it because that happens a lot as well. Uh, I also know that some agencies take, um, some consultant companies have members, have people there working especially temps. I see it happen with some of the clerical temps and, and some of the IT temps. They come in, they work 10, 15. I know a lady, she was a consultant for 25 years. 25 years she was a consultant working for the fire department. And, what, and then she was some, when she got too old and not able to keep up, she was some, she was terminated with no benefits. So she, if she would have been hired as a city worker, at least she would have had a pension and some benefits to fall back on. But nope, because she she worked as a consultant and she didn't um, she did not know how to navigate and how to become a city employee. She just continued working, dedicating herself. And then at the end of 25 years, she has nothing to show for. So it's just unfair to 
to the workers as well, because a lot of the consultants have reached out to me and they would like to be able to work. I encourage them to take civil service exam, which a lot of them have, but is the city is always looking to try to, um, they try, they claim they're saving money, but they're actually spending much more money than they would have if they would have just hired from a civil service list and utilize the civil service system. And another thing I will also realize <clears throat> when there's, um, there's a lot of uh, consulting companies that are not based in the United States. I knew for a fact there was a contract with, with, um, <clears throat> with um, the office of, um, with the one, the morgue, the office that deal with the morgue, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank. They had a consult, they had a manager who had a consultant company who used his family name. So use his family name, which is different from his name to order have the consultant company come and do work for that company, for, for the agency. And they took, took about $6 million and the work <clears throat> and the work never got done. And the, the money ended up overseas in India. And unfortunately, that's not the first time I heard of something like that happen. So <clears throat> I, I, I pray, I just I pray that you will look better into these contracts and stop the city and stop the, um, the management's appetite for contracts and consultants because it's not what's best. The city, the taxpayers of New York deserve much better because city workers, we care and love, my members care and love their jobs. They're there. They are vested. They are. They they check. They clean. Their, their background checks come back clean, and they're willing to do the work. They're willing to be trained. But management rather deal with something quick and fast and easy. And they want people to jump when they say jump. Not to say that my members don't jump, but my members know their rights, and they also know the system a lot, a lot better than a lot of these managers do. And management don't want to hear them. Management has their own agenda, and it changes each time there's a new mayor, and we understand that's the prerogative of the mayor, but my members know what needs to be done. They've been there, they are going to be there and they, and they know how to do the work. And please just let the city workers do their job and stop having consultants come in and try to circumvent and go around the civil services. Thank, Thank you, President Moran. Uh, I'm fighting for you and wouldn't be holding this hearing if I wasn't, and you know you're near and dear to my heart as a software developer. Uh, we're going to just, uh, if, if President uh, Puleo uh, will give us a moment, we're going to just ask uh, Executive Director Garrido a handful of questions, uh, sure. and then we'll we'll go to you if that's acceptable. Great. Yes, thank you. Uh, and, and we're going to open up questions to the whole panel. I just wanted to get uh, some questions in to the Executive Director. So first, I just want to thank you and all the members for risking your lives, your health, and many who actually ultimately paid the price. I know that when the mayor and the governor were telling people to work from home, uh, DC 37 members were being told to go into work each and every day. Um, and so I have about three or four questions for you. And we've, uh, so the first one is Executive Director Garrido, uh, just to be clear, did you testify that agency heads facing hiring freezes told you that they just outsourced those jobs? Uh, and, and if you can just explain what the difference between the person at PS and OTPS lines are and what that accounting trick is. So I did testify that because we've seen a flare up of contracting opportunities by the city of New York. Um, we monitor the procurement policies, DCAS sends very often uh, the ability to, um, you know, outsource. Local Law 63 require agencies to put forward a procurement plan and for the sake of transparency and say, here's how many contracts we're going to have. Here's the value of those contracts. Here's the city workers who may or may not be impacted by this. The agencies have made a mockery of this by simply putting an Excel sheet and putting the contracts that they find convenient and doing basically that. And what we have been beginning to do is as those agencies place those procurement plans in, in the mayor's office of contract, in consistent with the law, we are monitored to see, A, do we have a diminution of positions, as I testified before, and B, is there a reason why they're doing that? And this account, accounting trick is that the OMB sent an email, right, a memo to the agencies with the PEC program a program to eliminate the gap that had specific targets and then had a hard 
hiring freeze on it. Originally, it was no backfill, and then it was a one to three backfill, as the mayor announced. At the same time, no such hiring freeze is taking place with contractors. So the other than personnel service budget is something that they still can hire people from, but they're not hiring them as city workers. They're hiring them as contractors. Along those lines, uh, in conversations before this hearing, the administration contends that their definition, their legal definition of displacement only occurs when budgeted headcount is reduced. For example, this is a real example. If Parks has headcount of 117 people in a division, but leaves 50 positions unfilled, then hires contractors to do the work of those 50 people, the administration contends that does not meet the definition of displacement, and therefore they don't need to do a cost benefit analysis for outsourcing those jobs. Do you agree? Of course not. The administration is wrong. And I'm going to tell you, if you don't want to hear my testimony of them, we took the matter to arbitration and prevailed. We have an actual arbitration decision that defines displacement pretty quick, pretty uh, broadly, right? And very specifically. And look at the law itself. Now, don't listen to my testimony. Look at the law itself. Displacement shall mean a reduction in the number of funded position that is directly from local law 63, including but not limited to, resulting uh, uh, from attrition, demotions, bumping, involuntary transfers to a new class, title or location, and time-based reductions. That couldn't be any clearer. That's in the law. So whether you wanna hear my opinion on this, the law department's legal opinion or somebody at City Hall's legal opinion, let's look at the law and the fact. And the fact is displacement is very well defined. And if the administration wants to go that way, then we have no option but to take legal actions to enforce the law. And we will do so uh, if we need to get to that point. We're trying to avoid that because this was supposed to be a union-friendly administration a labor-friendly administration. But I always said, if you don't hold your friends accountable, what moral ground do you have to uh, those who oppose you to hold them accountable? So uh, I, I respectfully disagree with the administration in that place, in that definition of displacement. And, and just to clarify, uh, if arbitration uh, says that this is the reading of the law, that, that arbitration is binding, that's correct. Local law 63. So just to, to take it back a big step, all you, all the other presidents have said, and what we will hear from another president is that we want to save taxpayer dollars. And we want to make sure that if we're going to take the drastic step of outsourcing, we want to make sure that it actually saves taxpayers money instead of costing taxpayers more. Local law 63, the city can still outsource. Uh, all they have to do is a cost benefit analysis. And I, I'm not even sure if the law requires the, net, the cost benefit analysis shows that the city actually saves money, just requires that they have to do it. And when they do it, I get to hold the hearing if I disagree with it. How many times has District Council 37 received one of these cost benefit analyses uh, since local law 63 became law or even in the past, since, since this term has started? In the last seven years, um, or well, eight years since the implementation of the law, this C-37 has received three comparative cost analysis, three. $17 billion of annual contract, three times has the union. And all the, those analysis has been because the union has filed an objection with the controller on the registration of the contract. It has demanded that the analysis be done. In those three analyses, all three analyses was fund were fundamentally flawed. We receive an analysis on the cost comparison of 311 with the expansion of the contractor in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, we found that the con cost analysis was flawed because they were comparing the main lane rent to a Brooklyn Navy Yard rent, among other things, or inflating the cost of pensions overinflating the cost of health insurance for city workers and underreporting the cost of procurement for contractors. We receive a comparative cost analysis 
on a, a potential contract that was supposed to go on DOE um, at our request. And um, in fact, proved that uh, that comparative cost analysis was um, inappropriate and inaccurate. And we receive a comparative cost analysis on uh, some of the social services. In all three instances, we not only proved the cost analysis was wrong, but we managed to prove and the city agreed to insource the work, reverse it. There's a reason why they're not providing you cost analysis because they have to show the cost that there's an analysis going on. But there's no such analysis taking place right now. This is just an account gimmick to say, we're reducing the headcount for city workers as part of our saving, as opposed to a real thorough analysis that should be taking place under the loan. Uh, the city council is also supposed to receive these cost-benefit analyses. Our records indicate that we have not received one of these. And any cost-benefit analysis, since I've been chair of the contracts committee since last year, nothing this term since uh, January 1st, 2018. Uh, is that your experience? That is correct. All of those three instances that I mentioned were the beginning of this term. Uh, Executive Director Garrido, I, I understand you, you may have some time constraints. Uh, I see that Council Member Barron has a question. Is, uh, the, so, so does Council Member Rosenthal. Uh, are these for specifically Executive Director Garrido? And, uh, and uh, I don't know if uh, Executive yeah. Director Garrido can, can remain. Yeah, very quickly. Thank you. Yes. Okay, thank you so much uh, for the entire panel. And my questions will be very pointed. I'm uh, trying to understand. For uh, Executive Director Garrido, we'll open up to the rest of the panel as soon as we excuse him. Okay. Can I proceed? Yes, please. Sorry to interrupt. Can I continue, Mr. Yes, yes. Okay, Th thank you. Uh, thank you all for the work that you do and that your members do. You talked about uh, 250,000 to up to 500,000 uh, more to have work done by contractors than by your workers. Are you talking specifically about the IT contracts or were there others that were included in that? Right, no, we were talking about an analysis we did about 1500 IT consultants, but the same analogy has proven to be true on architects, the on engineers um, in project management um, where highly technical skills are done, um, where you have um, uh, security issues. We saw the Rus Russian hackers, right, trying to attend a lot of that. Uh, so the, the city was paying a lot for those cybersecurity consultants that have very specific skills when we needed them on a permanent basis. So the those were closer to the half a million dollar difference. And the sad part of it is, it's not the workers who are receiving the money. It's the companies mm -hmm. that are charging exorbitant markup over rates for providing a worker. And in many instances, we say, if you like that worker so much, hire him or hire her mm -hmm. and provide them service and a pension. And in reality, the city found out that in their contracts, a lot of those companies have a trick that prohibit the city from oh. hiring their employees without a penalty. And uh, so they were unable to do so even when they wanted to. And then quickly, um, is there an opportunity then for our labor unions to say, okay, don't, you don't need to put out this RFP, this contract, because our workers can do that work and to demonstrate that you have that capacity so that it doesn't, how can we prevent those contracts going forward when you have a body? What do you need to demonstrate that you've got the personnel already in place to do the work that the contracts then don't have to go out. Well, that's what Local Law 63 was supposed to be, uh, which is to provide notifications to the right. public, to the city council, to us, so that then we can say, here's a better way to do the work. But since the agencies are not complying, then it's hard for us to know. Quite often okay. we found the contract is already in place and the person has been employed. Council, That's the sad part. you will get 15 minutes later. I want to uh, let Councilmember Rosenthal ask one question. Thank you. I have to go to another hearing. Thank you so much. Okay. Appreciate Thank all you, the work of the panel. Thank you.
Okay, over to Council Member Rosenthal, just one quick question. For sure. Uh, great to see you um, always. Henry, you're amazing. Um, is there a department that's, I, I appreciated your listing the titles, uh, the position titles that often are, um, you know, uh, sort of disregarded. Are there any agencies in particular that abuse local law 3363? Yes, fire department, the health uh, HRA constantly, uh, DEP uh, only on the capital construction side, obviously. Uh, DOE was supposed to be part of the consideration, but they have not quite gotten there, right? And they have agreed to win source, but DOE is not fully covered by local law 63, only peripherally covered. That's something I think we need to work on. Yeah. Because DOE is responsible for half the size of the contracts in the city of New York. But certainly fire department, HRA, are at the top of our list of concerns. Uh, and, Department of, and, and, and TLC, I'm sorry. And TLC. TLC, yes. Oh, great. Uh, is do it in there? I only say that because of the IT and just. No, it's interesting because the mayor named do it as the citywide procurer of IT services. Yeah. But do it doesn't do, doesn't do it, <laughs> not one intended. Uh, the agencies are procuring something in spite of Dewey's recommendation not to outsource this contract. So we made a deal with Dewey will provide uh, services to the agencies and back charge those agencies in order not to displace people, sort of like a roving team that could service. Yes. And do it is not in the knowledge. So in my conversations with the commissioner, she's not aware of what these agencies are doing because the agencies act unilaterally and the, the ACO officers, the uh, chief uh, uh, contract officers are going forward with these procurement in violation of the law. Was that under Bloomberg, he had that, I'm trying to remember the name, the Technology Development Corporation or something where they did, it was like a private public partnership. It failed because he had no a legal standing with the agencies. And again, the agencies did their, their own doing. Yeah. So that's why it failed. Um, okay. But um, I mean, I think the mayor's office of contract has a responsibility. Right? Yeah. Thank you. And, yeah. And then just a last point, because I know you're trying to get some. Yes, I'm sorry. I have another meeting I have to go to. And that's actually, but I appreciate the questions. Absolutely. Okay. Last quick question. Do you think it would be fair to separate out the contracts with the nonprofit agencies to the contracts with more IT, goods and services, construction, et cetera. Is that fair so we can pluck out six million, six billion? I think that? that's fair, but I also think that if the agencies were doing the part and complying with requirements, notification, cost analysis, we wouldn't have to do that because routinely we'd be part of the agencies. Yeah. A, a mode of operandi, and that's this part that has not happened. So, okay. thank you, Council Member. Thank, thank you, you Mr. Much. Chair, and everyone else. And I appreciate it, but I'm sorry, I have to attend another. Executive Garrido, you are, uh, uh, Executive Director Garrido, you're excused. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're going to go to uh, President Julio uh, for his testimony, and then we will uh, begin the round of questions for the remainder of the panel. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Chair uh, Kellos and uh, City Council people. Uh, thank you for your services. And um, as Henry said, he, he was very well in articulating uh, the importance of um, Local Law 63 and how it impacts us, along with my other colleagues, uh, Laura and Anthony, um, uh, they, which they really, really, really um, hit, hit to the core. Uh, I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna emphasize on, on my experiences with contracting out. Um, you never get the level of uh, dedication uh, as you do with a, with a city civil servant. You know, these are people, uh, they came in, most of them out of poverty. You know, it's, it, it, it's become a gateway into the middle class. Uh, these are people who um, take these exams in order to make this a career. Now, as Henry has said, in the past, with these uh, contractors like uh, City Time in particular, there were billions of dollars that, that, that were stolen from the city of New York. It becomes a breeding ground for corruption. 
all city employees, like Laura has emphasized, Laura Moran, have to go through a background check. Okay, so they are evaluated. Um, you know, there's crystal clear transparency. You can find out anything about a city employee. You can find out how much money they make. You know, you can find out where they work. How do you find out when you have a corporation that just hires at will people and fires them? You know what I mean? What the operation is really like. And what are their estimates? You know, they talk about a certain amount of uh, money to go into a particular project. Those things never really fulfill what they originally um, in, um, uh, say what the costs are. So again, you know, I mean, we have to go to the core of this. Civil service was created thousands of years ago in China. Why? Because of corruption. You know, um, that's why they said, get the best person to take an exam who qualifies, who does not have any connection with anyone else in city government, take the opportunity and we get the best qualified candidate. Now, are we gonna go backwards at this? Are we gonna go back to the Tammany Hall days are we going to go back to you know, um, you know, when people you know just give each other jobs just just to exploit the uh, the coffers of the city? I mean, that's the direction I feel we're going when we start doing these these projects. And again, yes, people do give up their lives. You know, I've had three people lose their lives. One of them in particular was driving homeless people. Well, everybody else was told to go home. You know what I mean? Work from home. This person was told to pick up homeless people along with their belongings and as a result, died of COVID. So I don't know if you're going to get this type of dedication uh, anywhere else. And that's basically all I have to say. Everything else was said. And again, I like to thank, I thank all of you for having me here to express my opinion and the opinion and, and um, my, on, on behalf of my members. Thank you so much. Uh, just a, a quick uh, follow up. Uh, if you could share testimony about um, mechanics and any of the uh, relationships between people maintaining the city's fleet of vehicles and consultants doing the same work. Okay, particularly if you want to go into mechanics and, and, uh, uh, and uh, how, how these repairs are done. Uh, at one time, the parks department had a fully functional uh, repair shop. We have mechanics, and I knew the person's name. I'd call him up. His name was Mr. Pickles, by the way, right? And he would tell me uh, what was wrong with the car, when it would be fixed, when it was ready. So I had this personal, as well, and then we had everyone else too in parks. And you know, you knew that you would get the vehicle back. And he had an obligation, and uh, you know, he felt obligated to make sure that you were safe in that vehicle. Now we have these private companies who contract uh, these services. And then we find out that when the check engine light is on, the, the simplest way to correct it is clip the wire to the light. And now you don't have the check engine light on. They put the vehicles back into service just as bad as they were before, sometimes even worse because they do uh, shabby jobs with it. Uh, when we had, our, again, when we had the, the fleet service by, by auto workers, uh, mechanics, we didn't have these kinds of problems. You know, uh, It cost the city more money uh, another, I'll give you another example. Uh, one time, the city uh, employed a tire shop that would go out and replace tires for a vehicle. So that would mean if I had a flat tire in one of my cars, right, that I was driving for the city of New York, they would come out and they would do a great job. They'd come out and not only would they replace that flat tire, they replace all four tires, whether or not they needed it or not. Because why? The city would pay for the four tires. So these are just, you know, uh, simple examples, and, and uh, probably on a much smaller scale, what really happens out there, you know what I mean, of what they do. A city worker is under co constant scrutiny. I mean, you can call 311 right now and make a complaint about a city worker that's going to be investigated. You get that level, you get that level of responsibility uh, with, with, with a contractor. How do you know who to call, you know, and, and who, you know, how, how, how the investigation is going to be conducted? I don't, even, I don't know how much the individuals are that are getting paid for this. If I want to find out, you can go through see through New York, and we can find out all of our salaries through that. Yeah. So the the, the accountability is there. Uh, the system is not broken. Why break it? You know. And we've had that in in our in our city's history, uh, dark periods of time when um, you know when politicians were running amok. You know uh, earlier you know uh, in in our history. Do we want to go back there? And that's the direction this has taken us, unfortunately. Uh, 
thank you. I'm going to jump into uh, questions. So I'm um, going to ask questions of President Morand, um, and then I'll come back to President Pulio. Uh, President Morand, in your testimony, you know you, you shared that there's a contractor, 20, 22th century consultants. So they are you are you are testifying here today that even though the city is paying ostensibly a consultant, let's just call it if they're paying a hundred thousand a year to that quote unquote consultant, that consultant doesn't even see that hundred thousand. They're seeing eighty-eight because we are paying twenty-two thousand dollars, which is almost a, a half of or even two-thirds of a city employee just for 22 centuries. I guess is it placement that, of that's consultant. what you testified? Yes. Remember what is, what is 20 sec what is 22 century doing for 22,000 to 22 cents on the dollar? Just they have they just provide a body to come do the work. But they themselves are the only thing they're doing is they they refining these people who they so claim to be qualified, which are not always the case, and then they just placing them there and um to work and to do the work. So they um they do also, and they also happen to have supervisors. Um, they have um, they have a consultant there that supervises the other help desk people, and that person does reports and so forth to report back to FDNY management. But like I said, they get they they making money off off of all these employees they have placed there, as well as the person who is there to supervise the the rest of the help desk analysts. So they, they just more or less is like a, um, it's more like a, a, um, a job placement company, but they still continue to reap the benefits because they don't really, they don't pay benefits. Those people don't get benefits. Like they may get the five days, um, which I think was increased to seven days for sick leave now because of the um, state, because of the um, city mandate. But if it wasn't for that, a lot of those people got nothing. nothing. You testified that the city is paying to train consultants. So just to be clear, local law 63, the agency says, we don't have anyone with this experience. We don't have anyone with this expertise. <clears throat> then they hire a consultant who ha technically has the expertise. And then as soon as they come in, um, they then the city then pays for their training. Yes, I've seen, I, I know I've sat in, I've sat in, or, in Oracle classes at FDNY when I was doing data Oracle database administration. And I've sat in classes where the, the instructor come and has a class to, teach, to train certain aspects of Oracle. And there was consultants sitting in those classes with us. And, and there's been, I know for a fact I've seen consultants when we've been sent out to be trained on certain things, consultants sitting in on those classes as well. And I mean, being sent to a training facility. So, so we are paying for expertise that isn't there, and then we are paying people to train them with the expertise that they don't have. Exactly. I've also seen consultants come in, and we have to train them how to do the work. And they work side by side with our members, trying to um, troubleshoot and fix and do what do the work, and they and they get trained. And they even at one time there was a case where. They tried to have a consultant supervise a, a couple of staff members, and I had a fit. I was a shop steward at that time, and I had a fit. I said, "You cannot. That person shouldn't. That my members are not supposed to be reporting to a consultant." So they changed the dynamic after I complained about it. Is, but, who, I, but, I, but I'm pretty sure I bet you was going on still. So wait, I, I'm confused. They're they're not supposed to be outsourcing. They, they shouldn't be hiring a consultant to do a job that one of your workers is doing without doing a cost benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. So for the jobs where you see consultants sitting side by side with your members, are those jobs getting a cost benefit analysis to see if it's cheaper to hire a consultant to do the same work as one of your workers who makes a quarter or half what they are making? Well, if I don't have access to that information. Henry has more access than I do on that. But I do know for a fact the help desk analysts that, is, um, that work for the help desk we're making 90 some odd thousand, whereas you hire a computer aid. The base, the starting salary for computer aid in my local is 40 something thousand a year. 
and you got and you're gonna hire a uh, help and computer aids because it's data entry. There's a little um, light troubleshooting, so that it's not it's not a high level position. Help desk. Uh, so President Moran, the city is going to say that um, at this forty six thousand. Uh, that it is somehow cheaper to hire the consultant for 90,000 because of fringe benefits and health insurance and, uh, and a, a pension and a retirement. Uh, fringe benefits is, is no more, is used no more than 30% of an employee's salary. So that even with 30%, that's still not 90,000. I, I, I think you're right. I think you're right. I think that a cost benefit analysis would show that if you're paying somebody $90,000 and you're paying somebody else 46, even with all their benefits all in, that that isn't right. And I think there needs to be a cost benefit analysis. Um, it, it seems strange to me that consultants actually get trained by city employees to do city employee work. And, and, and don't get me wrong. There are some consultants who are very, they come in, they know their stuff and they do high level work. But those consultants are separate for the consultants who I've seen on a contract in particular, a contract for what they call a fire prevention and um, inspection management system at FDNY, in particular FPEMS they call it. They hired, um, they wanted to get rid of the mainframe for fire prevention at FDNY and they hired a company, I forgot, I can't remember the name, but they were supposed to be an integrator to, inter and to, go, to move over to a new, um, to bring a, a COTS product off the shelf computer product to customize it to FDNY's needs. And they brought literally these kids straight out of, out of college. One, I mean, from India, because that's another problem. They bring, they bring um, consultant companies, hire people who they bring them over on special visas who are not, they cannot work, even if the person has good qualifications and, 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 um, and can do the work, the city can't hire them because they come over on a special visa and can only work for that consultant company. And then, so they bring over a lot of these young kids who don't know what they're doing and that I'm sitting in meeting after meeting and you, and then there's a language barrier. So when you're dealing or not, when you're doing um, analysis phase of an IT project, the English on a lot of these young people is so bad that the mem the people who are the employees who are trying to do the knowledge transfer so they can customize the product can't understand what the consultant is saying. So that's another issue. In terms of training, you mentioned that some of your employees have a master's degree, some of them have PhDs. Yes. Is there anything out there where you as a union president would say, no, you may not train my workers to do this advanced technology work? <laughs> Never, no way. There's, I mean, if it's IT related and in the, in the title specifications, we will never get in the way of, of, of our members getting training. In fact, we, like I said, we do reimburse for training and certifications that help our members to prosper and move up their career ladder. Uh, thank you, President Morand. Uh, and then I guess last piece, uh, I, we, we will hear the administration argue that uh, they want to use consultants where you only need a short term need. You only need somebody for a couple of months. Maybe you need them for a year, but eventually that project's going to end. You testified that there was somebody who was a consultant for 25 years, never got their pension, never got their city benefits. And when they were, re were able to retire, they got nothing. How does somebody consult for 25 years? Why not just bring that person in as an employee? Uh, your guess is as good as mine, but I've seen a lot of times consultants who the city finds value in, who is helpful, who is able and capable of doing a decent job, the city will keep them and not hire them. Unless the person learns through other means how to take tests, because quite a few of them have gotten picked up off a civil service list, but quite a few have not. And I know in that particular case, the, the, the woman, um, she did not know to do civil service exams and she did. So therefore she just continued working as a consultant and ended up being terminated when she took ill and couldn't work no more. And it was very, yeah, it was horrible. But <clears throat> I've also know consultants who, um, who for, for, because of visa 
um, is not being a citizen, not having work authorization, they ha that they're tied to a company, but they, they have excellent skills, the city want to hire them, but they cannot be hired. And therefore, they work for a consulting company, and the consulting company is taking a large chunk of their salary, and the city will hire them and actually pay them what they're worth, but they can't because, because of the of visa situation, and only the consulting company they can work for. So... That, that, that despicable. And uh, thank you for sharing your testimony. I also want to share uh, that some of your members have reached out. I've had the pleasure of meeting with your union. Some of them have even blown the whistle. And we reported uh, people at uh, city agencies who have retaliated against your members for blowing the whistle because yes. of relationships between uh, city employees uh, some managers actually who were trying to steer work towards specific consultants um, and that I've reported those that situations to the Department of Investigations and I will continue to work with you Thank and DC 37 to make sure your members are protected and that anyone who wishes to blow the whistle who is hearing what you are saying the truth that you're speaking to power uh, they can email contracts at bencalos.com we will work with you. We will go through each and every contract anyone has specific knowledge of and uh, do our best to fight alongside you. Um, not just because I love my city employees, but um, we could, if, 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 we, if we are paying people $40,000 a year that we would otherwise pay a consultant twice as much, 90,000 a year for, it sounds like we could save billions of dollars and yes. uh, avoid a lot of cuts. I'd like to ask uh, President uh, Joe Polio some more questions. Thank you. Do we have enough mechanics to service the current fleet of vehicles? Uh, definitely not. Uh, I'll give you another example. Um, in Prospect Car, there was a big story about uh, garbage not being picked up. Uh, the reality of that was not because we didn't have the manpower, uh, it was because we did not have the vehicles. We did not have the container truck vehicles to pick up the containers. Uh, we have 20 cubic yard containers. They go down to uh, the dump. Uh, if the truck does not work to pick up that container to take it to the dump, well, guess what? It stays in the park. And when it stays in the park, it piles up. You get rats. You get all sorts of, um, you know, infestation of insects. Uh, it, it becomes it becomes you know a, a horrific scene for uh, for people that want to take their kids during COVID to go play in the playgrounds. So um, uh, when the story was reported, I don't think it was reported accurately. Uh, it made it seem as if there wasn't people to do the work. The people were there to do the work, but the vehicles were not there to fulfill uh, uh, the uh, the assignment. Uh, so this is this is what happened. This is happening now. Uh, the vehicles are not in the best of shape uh, if they're not properly maintained. And as we all know, uh, maintenance, right, is the key to this. If you don't change the oil of your car, you're not going to get the uh, life expectancy of the vehicle. Uh, that does not happen uh, on a regular basis the way it should be. Uh, the inspections are not conducted. I mean, we can go through the list. Uh, and again, I'm not a mechanic. Maybe Joe Colangelo who is uh, the mechanics um, local president can go into further detail in the future on this because he can give you the specifics because those are actually his members that we are losing as a result of this um, has had, you know, uh, an impact on all of us. You know, uh, my members, uh, uh, all the people in the city that, you know, use, uh, you know, use the parks or, you know, use, um, you know, um, you know, any, any, any of these uh, recreation centers, beaches, uh, if this, if the stuff is not you know, properly maintained, it costs it costs the city uh, millions upon millions, if not more, uh, each year uh, as a result of this. In terms of uh, the the parks projects, um, it it can take years to to fix a park, update a park. Uh, what is the impact of, for, for just the delays in, in parks improvements and maintenance on, on your members? Well, I don't know. Yeah, I think you probably said on some of these hearings, too, where it costs somewhere. Uh, I don't know what the latest figures are for a park uh, bathroom. I think, what, what is it, upwards of 12 to $14 million now, something of that, something that outrageous. Again, 
even projects like these capital projects, we have the workforce to do. You know, we could um, have our APSWs, our associate park service workers, right, who could operate these, the, you know, the machinery uh, necessary if they're properly trained to do so. We could, you know, uh, uh, we we could build stuff like this. Uh, we don't need to get these contractors out on, on these outrageous prevailing rate uh, assignments that never really, uh, you know, uh, uh, fulfilled their completion dates. Uh, and and you know, it's not just that. You know, we you know, the project uh, like I believe it was uh, one of the parks in Brooklyn uh, by the courthouses uh, where they had to do repaving uh, with pavers. You know. They hired a contractor to do that, that our workers uh, could definitely do as well. So these these are current examples of, of how much money is, is being spent on these contractors and how we could have saved. Uh, if you want to expand on this, you're going to open up your, uh, the genie is really going to be unleashed. And I don't know if we'll be able to put the genie back, to be quite honest with you, once it gets to a certain point where there's no more control. Um, and and that's, what, that's why I think We lost your sound. It's back now. Okay, we're back. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just had a brief interruption, uh, phone call. But um, but yes, you know what I mean. Uh, these projects do cost uh, a lot of money, where we can do the work ourselves in sourcing it. Yeah very much to our uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, seeing any questions from council members who may wish to add additional questions. I know we asked a bunch of them up front. Uh, seeing none, uh, we're going to excuse this panel. We wanna thank you uh, for your testimony. You're welcome to stay. You're also welcome to catch up on the live stream uh, or watch it on Facebook. We wanna thank you for your testimony. Thank you for your courage. I'll turn it over to my committee council. Uh, thank you, Chair Kalos. The next uh, round of testimony will be delivered by the administration. Uh, this will be uh, Keith Kerman, who's the Deputy Commissioner of DCAS, uh, Diane Jackier, who's the Chief of Capital Strategic Initiatives at the Parks Department, Matt Drury, who's the Director of Intergovernmental Relations at the Parks Department, and Parmod Tripathi, who's the Chief Contracting Officer at the Parks Department. Before we begin testimony, I will administer the oath. Uh, if any individual in the Administration can please raise your right hand and I will call on each of you individually for a response. Do you firmly tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Deputy Commissioner Kerman? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Jack here? Yes. Mr. Drury? Yes. And Mr. Tripathi? Yes. Thank you and you may begin. Okay, thank you, sorry. Uh, I'll be reading some brief testimony sort of on behalf of ourselves and, and, and uh, DCAS, uh, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Kalos and members of the Contracts Committee. My name is Matt Drury. I serve as Director of Government Relations at New York City Parks. Uh, joining me are some of our agency staff, uh, Diane Jackier, uh, Chief of Capital Strategic Initiatives and Pramad uh, Tripathi, uh, agency, uh, agency Chief Contracting Officer. We're also very pleased to be joined by our colleagues at the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. Uh, including Keith Kerman, uh, Deputy Commissioner and uh, NYC Chief Fleet Officer. <clears throat> Regarding the topic of today's oversight hearing, I'm pleased to report that New York City Parks is in full compliance with Section 312 of the City Charter as updated by Local Law 63 of 2011. In accordance with that law, city agencies submitted an annual procurement plan detailing the agency's anticipated contracting actions over $200,000 for the fiscal year, uh, which is publicly available on the Mayor's Office of Contract Services website. Uh, New York City Parks' report is segmented into two portions, which outline the contract activities related to both our operational expenses and capital project expenditures. Um, before, uh, in accordance with the charter, as amended by Local Law 63, before the issuance of a contract for standard or professional services, the agency determines whether such contract is the result of or would result in displacement of city employees within the agency, as defined by a set of criteria established within the charter. Uh, it might be helpful here to, to briefly provide some context for the city's uh, contracting process from our perspective. 
Uh, generally speaking, uh, New York City Parks seeks to secure a standard or professional services contract when the services required are of a highly specialized or technical nature and the agency doesn't have the appropriate in-house uh, expertise to provide those services. Uh, in a few uh, unique scenarios, uh, the services required represent a volume uh, that the agency's existing uh, employee uh, workforce don't have the staffing capacity to provide, which necessitates the use of a standard or professional services contract. Uh, for a variety of reasons that have emerged over the past year, uh, New York City Parks has actually undertaken significant reductions to many of our standard or professional service contracts uh, in consultation with the Mayor's Office of Management and Budget while retaining a consistent uh, funded staffing level of in-house agency employees. Uh, though broader dynamics might vary by agency, depending on the circumstances of a given fiscal year, uh, we, we believe that the reporting, uh, which is compelled by Local Law 63, uh, represents our administration's shared commitment to transparency and openness regarding uh, city contracting activity and compliance with the city charter's requirements is an undertaking we take very, very seriously as an agency. Uh, thanks for offering the opportunity to testify today. Uh, if there'll be a testimony from the public following our portion, though it seems that may have already taken place, uh, well, obviously uh, we have staff that'll be viewing uh, via the council's live stream. Uh, we're now happy to answer uh, questions you might have. Thank you. And that is testimony on behalf of uh, the administration as a whole. That's correct. Okay. Uh, we, we, we had a hearing with you shortly before the pandemic, which feels like a lifetime ago on November 12, 2019. Uh, at that hearing uh, with the subcommittee on the capital budget now chaired by council member Helen Rosenthal, Commissioner Silver and Deputy Commissioner for Parks, uh, Teresa uh, Braddock testified that design division was operating with 55-0 vacancies uh, to the best of your knowledge, have these vacancies been filled? Uh, as I will have to double check with our personnel as, as to the exact uh, number of vacancies on the capital design side, my understanding is it's considerably less than that at this stage. Are, will you be, so, so as of 2019, the headcount was 117, despite the fact that there was 50 less than budgeted uh, in terms of headcount. Uh, with the mayor's hiring freeze, his three to one hiring freeze, does this mean you will not be able to fill these budgeted positions or will you be able to fill every single budgeted position? I mean, the funded position, the levels of funding funded positions remains consistent and has and, and represents a, a really significant increase over the course of this administration compared to the capital design uh, headcount that had existed previously. So the number of funded positions has actually increased. Uh, over time, there are some, you know, there are some existing vacancies as exist in any kind of corner of uh, any city agency at any given time. Those are sort of frictional uh, pieces of point. And, you know, as to broader dynamics about, you know, broader citywide hiring practices, you know, that's, it's, it's hard for us to speak to that individually in a vacuum, yeah, obviously. Uh, that's something where you, know, you, need, you need to discuss with OMB or, you know, entities of that nature. Sure. Uh, the if, if somebody from your team while we were talking can look up the specific number of vacancies. Um, I know that this is something we, we flagged ahead of time and wanted to continue our conversation from 2019. So to be very clear and specific, uh, if the number of funded positions is still 117, and if there is still an open head count uh, 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 vacancies of 50, will parks through this budget hire all 50 of the remaining headcount, or will you not because of the hiring freeze? I, I can assert, I can, I can clarify that the number of funded positions is considerably higher than you cited 117. So on the capital design side, it's considerably higher than that, uh, closer to 180 or so. And the headcount, uh, the the vacancies is considerably less than what you cited. Uh, I, you know, I will not be able to provide uh, those precise numbers uh, other than to characterize them as I just have. Will you fill? every single vacancy. Uh, we'll, we'll, working with OMB, we hire whenever and whenever we can. You know, I think it's important to note that, you know, in the course of any activity, you know, our capital design folks, we have the best architects and engineers uh, in the world, we believe, that are, you know, creative and, and really make, you know, these, these parks really special places. You know, it, it, it can, you know, take time to fill uh, vacancy, vacancies, even outside of this environment. Obviously here in COVID, you know, as the mayor's discussed, there are, you know, sort of hiring practices and protocols being put into place. But, you know, I, you know, broadly speaking, I think we need to defer to the mayor's office of management and budget on, on those dynamics. Uh, Deputy Commissioner, uh, Drew, forgive me for, I, I am 
looking for the simplest possible answer. So you've said that there's a budgeted headcount of 180. And so I'm asking if the mayor's hiring freeze is three to one hiring freeze or anything else he is talking about in, in the scope of the budget, whether that will prevent you from hiring the full 180 headcount. I mean, my, again, I think it's a matter, uh, I think the specifics of how the three to one uh, hiring practices being put into place is, is, is hard for me to speak to. But, you know, I, as I understand it, the funding positions remain in place, are the funded positions, you know, as that hire, you know, hiring is, you know, discussed and approved by OMB at various points in time. So, you know, am I, you know, I think it's, I don't, I don't think it's a question of if, but when. Okay. So, so you can testify that it, it is the intention of the parks department to fill any and all budgeted headcount. Certainly, I think that's you know, every agency's, uh, within every agency's uh, uh, interests, sure. Thank you, that, that means a lot. Um, coming into this hearing, I was under the impression and, and perhaps wrongfully so, that agencies were leaving their budgeted headcount unfulfilled in order to generate cost savings. So that is that was a misunderstanding? Uh, I mean, sure, I don't wanna to speak to what you may or may not have believed. I, 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 I'm asserting my belief. You were telling me that if you've got budgeted headcount of 180, you're going to fill those positions to the best of your ability. I mean, I'll, I'll speak specifically for parks, though I believe most agencies would agree that, like, you know, we, 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 we you know, we have the best workforce in New York City and we, you know, we have plenty of work to go around. We keep our employees very, very busy. They do an amazing job and we, you know, we hire when we can, uh, you know, as, as we can. And, you know, obviously that, you know, this is a very specific fiscal environment that's difficult for everyone, uh, New Yorkers and including governmental agencies. But, you know, I can't really speak to those those broader dynamics. At the 2019 hearing, we discussed that uh, parks had delays of up to 12 months before capital projects could even get into design at times. Uh, and there were these open positions. Uh, has the delay been reduced from 12 months at all since we uh, last had our hearing? I'll say that I, you know, you, you're using the word delay, and we, we wouldn't characterize it that way whatsoever. You're and right. We spent a, a 15 minutes, a half an hour negotiating, uh, arguing about what the term delay meant. So uh, however you wish to characterize it, uh, there was a 12-month something. Yeah, they could. so the, the agency's goal, uh, and, you know, for at least during the course of this administration, is to begin uh, park capital work in the same fiscal year in which that project becomes fully funded. That is, that is, that has become our goal and we've been remarkably successful at it. That does, you know, because we can get at, up, you know, several hundred fully funded projects in a given year. And I'll, I'll use an, you know, sort of a, a metaphor we like to use fairly often here. You know, if you have a, an airport, if you have 150 planes, they can't all take off the runway at the same time. At the end of the day, you know, we have amazing capital design staff, but it's a, but it is a finite number. Um, and therefore, you know, you can't start every single project on day one of the new fiscal year. So there is sort of a, a project flow, a queue, if you will. Um, and we do our best to sort of take a look at the sort of citywide, you know, which, which projects are, you know, related to health and safety, you know, which projects sort of fit the various, you know, skill sets of, of, of our in-house staff and, and proceed accordingly. Um, and so, but that, you know, by definition, some capital projects in the course of that fiscal year will start before others, but it, it is still very much our commitment and we've been remarkably successful with this, is beginning those capital projects uh, within that fiscal year. In your testimony, uh, that in your written testimony and, and what you just shared, you indicated uh, challenges related to, to volume that have led you to hire uh, people who are doing the similar jobs to what your city employees are doing or the best and I appreciate that. Um, is is that correct? So so you have a certain you have these 180 folks. They're trying to deal with these hundred capital projects, and in order to achieve your goal of getting these moving forward within the same fiscal year, you are hiring consultants to do the same work as the city employees would be doing. Is that correct? It, it depends on the fiscal year and it depends how many projects get fully funded. But in the last several years where we've seen from, you know, the council discretionary funding and, you know, we've seen our volume of, of projects in each given fiscal year uh, really actually increasing pretty significantly over the last couple of years. Uh, this year, I do have to note that uh, the, the, uh, 
the agency has undergone an effort in consultation with OMB to essentially, re, you know, to to bring as, as much work in house as possible. So I think it's important to note that our we're keeping our in house design staff very very busy, and they're and they're rising to the challenge for sure. That is tremendously great news. You hear heard it here first. So in the procurement plan that you published, I think you had several dozen consulting contracts for that. Just because it's in the procurement plan, does it mean you will actually put that out to procurement or it is just a plan and that you can deviate from it? Yeah, well, in accordance with the city charter, you know, it's an anticipated plan, right? So that, so the agency and, you know, we're receiving this guidance from, from Mox and, and OMB and others, you know, we do our best. It's a snapshot in time and it happens, you know, generally speaking at the beginning of the, of the fiscal year. So it can be really hard to, to, to determine with true finality exactly which uh, projects, you know, will end up going out. So, you know, so we err on the side, obviously, of, of uh, being open and uh, being overly transparent, if anything. Uh, and so there is, uh, to a great degree, there is often the case where we're able to bring many of those, many of those projects uh, sort of back in house, if you will. Uh, how many contracts uh, that you were, were in your local law 63 do you plan anticipate bringing back in house? A good, you know what? We'll have to check with our team on the exact numbers. Uh, you know, a, a good, a, anecdotally, I can say it's a, a good percentage, but I, I'll have to get back to you with a more precise number. Similar to what we talked about with IT, uh, you have two local law 63 reports, uh, one that involves new procurements, and then you have ones where they are renewals. Some of the renewals have been renewed multiple years. Uh, I think you already answered it, but just why not bring all those contracts that have been renewed for one, two, three, four, even five years in-house because ostensibly we're, we, we've got the bandwidth, we've got the projects coming in and, and we just need that bandwidth guaranteed. Yeah, uh, that's, uh, thank you for the question. I think it's, you know, in many of those cases um, and, and most often those, those services often uh, reflect sort of a, a technical expertise that doesn't exist, you know, in current, you know, our, our staff are the, the greatest, but there are times when that needs to be supplemented uh, with external efforts. And so by and large, even if it's, even if it is intermittently throughout the course of a given year, you know, maybe several years in a row even, uh, but there are certain, you know, practices that do, you know, that do require uh, a really specialized technical expertise that, you know, uh, isn't currently rep represented by our uh, employee staff, amazing as they are. Do you believe that training, that education or training can give somebody expertise that they don't currently have? Yeah, I mean, I, I understand, I appreciate the question, but I think we're getting into sort of a philosophical like, discussion about like, you know, a city's workforce. And I, I really have to defer those kind of questions to, to you know, the Office of Labor Relations and the, and the you know, Mayor's Office of Contract Services. I, I, I appreciate the heart of the question, but I'm not, I'm not prepared to kind of speculate on sort of, you know, the you know, the, the, the philosophy behind, you know, city employees, uh, and, and, you know, I'm one, you know, everyone in this panel is one, many people in this panel are one, you know, we, we're proud of the work we do, but, it, you know, it's hard for me to speak to those broader dynamics. I appreciate it. Is anyone else on the panel able to, to speak to the question of whether or not education and training can help give somebody an exp expertise? I, I will sort of say just, you know, and this, this is sort of ancillary to your question, but I will say that, you know, our agency is certainly extremely dedicated to like to workforce development and, you know, provides a, a, a you know, a really robust set of, you know, trainings and, and you know, because we like to see people, you know, there, this is this is a type of agency where people spend literally decades going from, you know, a park ranger to, you know, a commissioner of the agency like that's been known to happen. So we're, we're extremely proud of that in terms of our professional development here when it comes to sort of highly tech, technical specialized uh, that, you know, you know, services. That's a really interesting uh, notion, con you know, conversation. I think it would come down to the specifics of how and when those services are implemented and, you know, whether a full-time employee is the right fit. You know, those are all uh, considerations that are sort of bigger than any single agency. Uh, let's take the, the, the definition of delay, the definition of display. Uh, actually, sorry. Uh, uh, Executive Director Garrido defined the definition of displacement based on an arbitration decision to be broader than previous conversations around the text of the law. Uh, where is the administration on their definition of displacement? Is it, uh, how would you define the definition of displacement? Well, I'll simply note that I'm not, you know, I, I apologize, but I'm not familiar with the uh, 
arbitration that was referenced earlier in, in the uh, previous uh, panel. Um, and I, I don't believe my colleagues are, I, I, you know, we're, we're, but we're happy to hear more about that uh, just internally, just from our perspective. Uh, I will say that the, you know, uh, uh, the executive director Greedo did also mention that the, the law is pretty clear, you know, it actually, you know, it, it reads displacement shall mean a reduction in the number of funded positions. You know, the law says that. Uh, so I, you know, I think there are, uh, there's guidance that's been sort of, that's evolved over time, you know, that's provided to all the agencies, uh, I think at the front end of when this law was, uh, uh, and so, you know, how that gets interpreted, you know, I think is relatively uh, pretty clearly laid out in, in, in the bill. Uh if we could set aside uh, disagreements around the definition of displacement, given the fact that parks is trying to get as many capital projects done as possible, we need parks more than ever before because of the pandemic. I will say thank you to parks if I haven't before because uh, we were able to get a playground uh, ground broken to open in 14 months. It was about, I think a two or three acre playground. I've been there with my daughter. She was there playing on my same equipment as I was for a time. And, and now she's playing on brand new equipment and it is a destination playground. Uh, could parks department benefit, irrespective of whether or not they are required from local law 63 to do a cost benefit analysis of uh, bringing specific positions in house uh, in spite of the higher increase, because it will save money. Uh, I mean, I guess just broadly speaking, I think, you know, the agency is always looking at ways to maximize its resources. So I think whether it's a formal cost benefit analysis or just, you know, general, uh, you know, sort of assessment on an ongoing basis, I think we're constantly looking at ways to kind of, you know, take our existing resources, be it workforce, be it budget, uh, and, you know, and, and maximize it. So I think in general, you know, again, our, our, our employees are fantastic. Uh, we keep them very, very busy uh, and they do fantastic work as you noted, thank you. And, and we're glad to hear uh, your, 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 uh, your daughter's enjoying it. Um, I, you know, I think, you know, I think there's always, uh, we're always open to kind of considerations of, of what, how the, opera, how the agency can, you know, use taxpayer dollars most wisely and most efficiently and, and deliver, you know, the best results for New Yorkers. Uh, I, I will say that my, my daughter won't play on the equipment that's for her age. She only goes to the equipment that's for much, much older than her. And <laughs> she gets scared because it's pretty high up. So then I end up on that same equipment. So uh, I, I enjoy the equipment with my daughter. Uh, it sounds like Parks has made a commitment to start to uh, bring some of the consulting jobs in because you're recognizing there's higher val volume. Uh, and I'm just, it sounds like that is something that was either just recognized as a, was, was that something that you recognized as a value or is it something where there was actually some sort of cost benefit analysis or decision memo or something that Parks did that you can possibly share with other agencies, uh, with yeah. us or other agencies? I, I'm not aware that it was the result of a specific work product per se. I think these are just, you know, the sort of dynamics that have evolved, you know, uh, over time specific, you know, uh, you know, some, you know, facing some really unique challenges right now, for example. Um, so I think, you know, these are, you know, just, I think just, I think it's a testament to the fact that the agency is constantly being as flexible as it can be and maximizing the resources to, to our, to the best degree possible. Thank you. Uh, so I, I need to put out a, a protocol question. I don't know any, so, so first I just want to say to, to Parks, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for, for answering questions forthright and honestly and uh, there are some numbers that we're still going to want from 2019. Can you commit to uh, reconciling the numbers from 2019 and the headcount? And just, I think I have you on the record that if there's a headcount you will be hiring for it, we will probably want to make sure we have an agreement what your headcounts are, what your actuals are. Will you, will you share your budgeted versus actuals along with whether or not the jobs are posted? Uh, yeah, sure. Absolutely. We're happy to get you an update on, the, on those. Okay, because um, my, my contention, I guess, if you, if you would agree or not, if, could you tell me, would you agree that if there's a vacancy, but if the job isn't posted, that that might fall into my my, my belief that uh, if, if you have a vacancy and you're not posting the job, that you have no intention to fill it or a person has no intention to fill it? 
Yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, just to, only because I'm not as involved in sort of the details of how and when uh, jobs, you know, get publicly posted and how that works. I don't know if it, sometimes it's for periods of time because, you know, related civil service titles, it may be that there's certain windows that they're posted for. So a position may need to kind of come up and down at various times. So it's, I think that's kind of getting into some uh, pretty personnel specific details that I think we need to talk, talk to, uh, you know, management and budget and uh, Office of Labor Relations and some other folks. I don't, I don't want to speculate in terms of the details of how and when uh, and then for how long various positions get posted. Uh, I think my last question for you in parks is just, uh, we heard from uh, Executive Director Garrido that agency heads, and I, I'll just say myself, I have heard from people in agencies that when there's a hiring freeze, that there is a freeze on just the personnel services budget line and that when there is not a corresponding freeze on other than personnel services, so technically humans on one side, uh, staplers, phones, desks, for other than personnel services, that um, they can still spend for humans out of that OTPS, they just have to call them a consultant, and that they that is still a practice that happens. Is that something you're familiar with, that you've heard of, or that Parks has ever engaged them? I can only speak to a couple different, uh, I can speak to one dynamic and, and broadly speaking, at least certainly in this environment, uh, our agency's reliance on external contracts has been reduced drastically. So, so the notion that there's, you know, sort of mo moving chess pieces around it, you know, I, I, so that is just a broad statement of pact. It's, it's not as if contracting and, you know, for some of these subsets are going up. Uh, that is not the case in our, at least I can only speak, you know, for our agency. Are you, we've had serious difficulties with local law 63, uh, in many cases, folks are complying, but something that the, the we've heard testimony on is that we, we know what the headcount is. You, you know, it's 180. Do you have a headcount of consultant, of consultants, the consultant headcount of project managers, architects, engineers? Uh, in terms of what's, you know, in terms of active contracts, uh, we'd need to talk to our, our budget team and, and get that, uh, you know, I'm actually not sure. Uh, no, I wouldn't have that. I want to collaborate with us and just trying to find a better measure because I'd love to be in a position where if the mayor is saying I want to reduce the uh, city employee headcount by 5,000 that we could say also we have a contracted uh, 1099 employee headcount of X and we can do that and have something to measure by other than by the number. Yeah, I appreciate the question. I don't know if those contracts are linked to individual bodies or headcount in that manner. I don't know, because it's usually a dollar value for a service. I don't know that it's always necessarily, to, you know, because it's dependent on the, on the contractor to provide said service and the number of actual individuals that it might take to provide that service might vary. But again, we're, we're kind of getting into some of the details. I have to refer to our contracting you know, team and, 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 and uh, uh, MOCs and other, other entities to kind of speak to that. We've shared a bunch of the questions. We will send a letter with those questions as well as any follow-up, are you able to get us answers in writing in the next two weeks? Uh, you know, we'll take a look at the questions. I, you know, I will obviously do our, we'll, as always, we'll be as responsive as we can be and, and, uh, and get you the information as quickly as we can. Okay, so uh, for DCAS, I wanna thank them for coming. Uh, I need to, as, as a protocol question, just apologize. Uh, in our rush to prep for the hearing, I uh, picked up the phone and, and called one of my brothers and sisters in labor who was at a one mechanics union and uh, inadvertently called the wrong mechanics union. We're now joined by President Joseph Colangelo of Local 246. Uh, I had originally intended to have him on the first panel. So um, I know that uh, DCAS Deputy Commissioner Keith Kerman of Fleet still has not had a chance to respond to any questions. I've not directed any questions. I will not do a back and forth, but uh, would Deputy Commissioner uh, Keith Kerman be, uh, allow us to break the typical protocol of uh, allowing President Colangelo to testify. And then uh, we will ask follow-up questions for him and then direct any questions to you. Uh, there will be no back and forth. We will not put him back up after he has completed his testimony. Uh, the record reflects that uh, I, the audio did not come through for, for Deputy Commissioner. Sure. Thank okay. you. Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, I think the, the parks folks are, are free to go and leave their folks from staff to pay, pay attention. I want to thank DCAS Deputy Commissioner Kerman for his uh, 
being here and his uh, allowing this uh, change in protocol. Uh, President Colangelo, please accept my, my sincerest apologies uh, for the mix up. Um, uh, and uh, I wanted to, if you wish to give some testimony about Local Law 63 and outsourcing and particularly with regards to maintaining our city's fleet. Thank you, uh, Kim and Kellos. I, I, you know, I know, I know it was a little mix up, and you know, with all the Zoom stuff going on and uh, the invites going back and forth and the cancellation. So I, I appreciate it, and I, and I thank you for the call this morning. Um, I just start off by saying uh, I have a long history uh, with uh, the city of New York. I started back as a uh, auto service worker back in 1981. Um, I have a long history also with the local. Uh, I was uh, elected trustee, a shop steward in 1991, and a trustee in 93. Uh, subsequently became the vice president in 2002, uh, president in 2004, and uh, that's why I currently uh, hold the position today. Uh, when it comes to regards to um, the outsourcing uh, of, uh, you know, specifically my members' uh, work, uh, the auto mechanics work, um, there's a long history of uh, a sort of a disagreement uh, with the past administrations on uh, the, not only the effectiveness, but uh, the savings, if any, uh, that occurs when we do outsource work. Uh, what I would say is the fact that, uh, you know, outsourcing started uh, probably back in 1995. Um, Commissioner uh, Kerman is uh, well aware of that. Uh, we've had our uh, differences over the years, I would say, Keith, uh, with that. Uh, so that being said, uh, when it came to Local Law 63, when they first instituted that, the specific language about that when an agency outsources the work, uh, that they have to essentially sign off and say uh, that no employee disruption uh, will occur. Now, my argument always is the fact that it, it always occurs. How does it always occur? It occurs through attrition. When you, when you make a statement on a particular contract that's going out to, uh, to a private entity, uh, I'll talk most recently, it's, it's probably, uh, oof, it's, it's got to be 10 years, maybe, or uh, close to it, uh, the parts uh, contract where they, uh, they buy their parts through a, a third party vendor. Uh, one of the things in that contract, and it was after Local Law 63 was put into effect, was that particular language. I argued at the time that uh, just making a statement that we're not going to displace city employees is, 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 uh, is, is not factual in the sense that through attrition, people will lose their jobs. Uh, you know, when it comes to outsourcing and what you just uh, spoke about uh, with the, when it comes to budgeting, uh, there's a hiring freeze, but yet the capital budget doesn't seem to be impacted. So we've seen a large, uh, my local, my members have seen a large increase in outsourcing uh, over the past few years uh, on repairs in particular agencies uh, that we've never seen before, particularly in the Department of Sanitation. Department of Sanitation headcount went down. Uh, Department of Sanitation had a huge issue with uh, space and uh, buildings and uh, things that uh, impacted their ability to perform the work. Uh, so because of that, they, they had to turn to, uh, to sending vehicles out, which they never did before. Like I said, I'm here 39 years. Uh, Department of Sanitation, uh, we never sent work out. And then they started to send work out. Uh, when it comes to the Parks Department, which there's a long history of, I would argue for the fact that when the work goes out to a private entity, specifically with mechanical repair, uh, that some of that work comes back and it's not, the, it's not the same as when my members would do it and we wind up fixing the equipment twice. Um, so, you know, there is always a lively debate that would go back and forth with this. And there's always an argument on management side for the reasoning behind why they need to, uh, whatever the contract may be, why they need to use a private entity, whether it be uh, particularly to uh, upscale to, uh, you know, maybe do that work in house or all of those arguments that, that we hear back and forth over the years. But I would always, you know, and then again, I represent you know, hardworking members that, that fix and keep knows this, one of the largest non-military motor fleets in the world. Uh, you give it to our members to fix it and we fix it. 
uh, whether it be the, we represent also the machinists that work at DEP. Uh, DEP had an outsourcing contract that went to uh, um, uh, Viola, right? Viola. Now, Viola contract was in the, under the Bloomberg administration, was in, in the millions of dollars. Uh, you know, what, what, they, what were they doing? Uh, they were extending the maintenance contract on equipment to say that you didn't need the services equipment every three years. You could do it every five years. Now, what is the history of Violia? Yeah, you save money on the maintenance, but what, what do you pay for in the end? You got dilapidated equipment that needs replacement. Now, Violia, Violia also came in uh, with Health and Hospitals Corporation. I know it's a separate entity, but I'll just state this. Violia came in, they made a recommendation to Health and Hospitals Corporation under the Bloomberg administration that where are we going to save money? We're going to cut 50%, five, zero, 50% of the in-house staff of the carpenters, electricians, sheet metal workers. What did that do? So what recommendation did they take? Yeah, you're right. We should cut the workers. They didn't take anything else, but we should cut the staff. What did that do? The hospitals. And now we're in the middle of a pandemic. You know what kind of disaster you have? Because what are you doing? Now you're outsourcing to work to who? Who are these people that are coming into the hospitals? We always made the argument, even when you're bringing people in, I need a background check as a city employee. You got to fingerprint me. You got to do all of this and other stuff. But yet when we bring in a private entity, who signs off? The owner of the company says, oh no, my, my employees are all good. You know, I, I listen, you obviously know where I come from, right? I come from the labor side. I mean, that's quite apparent in, in my, you know, in my presentation here. And I know there'll be discussions on management side for their reasoning why they need to do the things that they do. I would say that when it comes to accountability and when it comes to asking somebody who's responsible, when you have city employees, we take the brunt of that. We are always responsible. I always use this line and, and you know, it, it was, it was meant as a joke, but it, it, it's factual in a sense. When I fixed the sanitation truck, I was a mechanic for the Department of Sanitation for close to, you know, well, almost 20 years before I went into the office, right? I would say, you know what I would say to the sanitation worker when he took the truck out? You got a lifetime warranty on that because if you break it, I'm going to fix it, okay? That's the fact. That's what a city employee does. You know, we don't we don't point fingers to say that, oh no, it was his fault, it was their fault. No, we fix it, we fix it. I'm proud of my membership. I'm proud of the, the, of, of the work that they do and I will defend them to no end. I'll just, I'll leave it at that and I'm open to questions from anybody. Uh, you just got an applause from council member Perkins's team. I see that, thank you. Uh, so I guess the first question is, do we have enough mechanics to maintain the city's fleet of vehicles? And what contracts are our vehicles being outsourced for repairs on? I, I would answer wholeheartedly no. We gave a full presentation. I believe I might have emailed it to your office. Uh, we did a city council hearing back in January where we presented our findings based on the amount of equipment, uh, based on the industry standard of how many uh, mechanics you need per uh, the size of that fleet. Uh, we showed in the Department of Sanitation alone, the optimal uh, staffing level. And of course it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it, it goes up for discussion. You would need a thousand mechanics. And we are currently have uh, under 550. Uh, the equipment, the size of the fleet in sanitation department uh, increased exponentially over the years with the new purchase of snow equipment and different types of snow equipment. Uh, and the agency uh, was not able, didn't have the ability to hire more mechanics. Uh, we've seen an increase in the shortage of mechanics just in that one particular agency. Um, and it goes into fleet consolidation. There's all other factors that, that uh, factored into that. And uh, what did it do? Uh, in this time of crisis, even in the Department of Sanitation, that's what I spoke about earlier, the equipment is going out to private vendors for repair. Uh, I have a real problem with that. Uh, you know, I understand. Go ahead. What's the contract? Who, who, who's getting it? Well, what happened? Okay, there's a city, there's a contract, which is a state contract, 
um, which is ARI, which means that, um, you know, and, and it's administered through uh, DCAS, uh, they, they pre-qualify a vendor to do work for the city. So now the city has a list of vendors that they can send the work to because they're pre-qualified. So when, when, they, when there is a need to send equipment out, in that particular case, regardless of the agency, they can use that ARI contract, which is a state contract, to send equipment out. The vendors are few, they're all over the city. Uh, there's a couple, I don't know the names off the top of my head. There's a couple that have been used for probably well over 20 years or more, probably 25 years. Uh, you know, and those vendors actually come in, you know, come out. There are there's certain types of repairs that we might not have the ability to do. But what I've seen lately is I've seen repairs going out that we can do in-house that now be done by outside vendors because of the shortage of staff. Uh, we haven't heard it from the administration. Well, we heard it briefly from Parks that there are some expertise that just may not be available in-house on some of their contracts. Is there, I'm a computer guy. You hand me a computer, I'm gonna fix it. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a mechanic, I'm not good with cars. I did not have that at my high school, but um, is there any type of car, is there some sort of expertise that your members are lacking in fixing sanitation trucks or police cars or other items like that? Or is it something that if, if it's got four wheels or more, you got it, you can fix it or even two wheels? We fix everything. I'll give you one specific example that I'm proud of. When the Priuses first came out, remember the, the, the electric, the first electric cars were the, was the Prius, right? The police department purchased those Priuses. Now for the police department, they needed to have specific equipment on that vehicle, light packages and all this other stuff and the computers inside and everything that goes along with that. My members install that equipment where the manufacturer was like, wait a minute, you can't do that. You know, it wasn't designed for that type of equipment. The, the uh, charging system won't be able to do all these kind of stuff. Guess what? They did it. You asked, the, you get the police department on here. I've been in those shops. We rebuild those entire vehicles specifically for the police commissioner. The, the only thing that we outsourced, and years ago we used to do that, was the ballistics installation to make the vehicle bulletproof. But if you got, if, uh, you know, I don't want to use that term, but I'll use it anyway, because and if you, if it's got four wheels and it operates and it's got a motor on it or whatever you want to put on it, electric cars and whatever, we can fix it. That's what my members do. Everybody comes in with five years of experience. They're called journeymen. They can fix anything. And I, I would challenge anyone to say that my members can't fix a piece of equipment. I'll give you one more because I can go on for days. The fire department have apparatus that cost over a million dollars. City ambulances cost $300,000. Do you think we know what we're doing? We're fixing pieces of equipment that cost in a half a million dollars or more. So when it comes to a discussion about can my members fix it? Absolutely. And they've proven it time and time again. Uh, I think I just, I, 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 we could go on and on all day on this. I, I wanna be respectful to uh, Deputy Commissioner uh, Kerman, who is very polite about uh, letting us breach protocol here. So I think- uh, Thank you. I have just, I'll just try to convert them into one last question, which is just, have you seen the lifespan of sanitation trucks or other fleet vehicles reduced as a result of uh, the, the outside contractors? And if a person who is in your union doesn't make the repair properly, uh, do they see uh, disciplinary or other consequences that are not found with contractors? Okay. My final question, and I'll, and your testimony and move back to DCAS and thank folks for their indulgence. Yeah, I wanna thank Keith also uh, for, for allowing this change. Uh, there was an increase in uh, the life cycle of equipment 
that directly impacts uh, the ability of that equipment to perform its duty. What does that mean? There was a life cycle of seven years on sanitation trucks, meaning that after seven years or you know, goes actually before up until the eighth year, that that equipment needs to be replaced. So you always have a cycle of purchasing new equipment based on the age of the fleet. There was a change by adding one year to that life cycle. That additional year to the life cycle on paper, I would argue, looks produced a huge amount of savings. But what that effectively does is now you have older pieces of equipment out there that don't perform as well. And like you would, anybody on this call would know, the older the car gets, the more problems you have. And in addition, just I'm just going to talk specifically about sanitation equipment. We use that equipment. We use that equipment for snow removal, for, for refuse removal. And we use that equipment all year round. And we use that because sometimes three shifts, triple shifts. So I would argue that an increase in life cycle has been detrimental to, to the equipment, be having the ability to perform what it's designed to do. And of course that would increase the cost as far as the maintenance goes of that equipment. Um, you know, and, and the older the equipment gets, you're gonna need more people to fix it. So there's a, there's a kind of give and take with that argument. I would think that uh, that would be something uh, that you could, you know, could be argued, uh, debated in both ways. I would argue, and I will just leave it at this, the savings that we saw by the increase in life cycle, a portion of that should have been used to hire more mechanics to maintain the equipment. I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you, uh, President Colangelo. Thank you for being so gracious. Uh, seeing if any council members have questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, so we will now go back to uh, uh, um, DCAS. Uh, and so uh, when, when I heard from President Colangelo about this, I, I flagged it for the administration ahead of this hearing. Um, I guess the, the particular question I had for, for DCAS having been previous GovOps chair, um, we, we've kicked the tires over at Fleet. We've gone through all the vehicle sales. We, we, we've done a lot to just try to make, to, to do oversight on, on DCAS Fleet. And it's been, you run a very tight ship there, especially with a lot of the vehicles that are coming in. Just again, thank you for the protocol. The uh, question that came up from, from President Colangelo that was concerning is just the notion that we don't necessarily have enough mechanics and that uh, when things are going out to uh, the uh, ARI contractors that they are coming back still in need of repairs or getting unnecessary repairs. So I wanted to bring that to your attention and uh, see, see what is there because that would be the opposite of cost savings for our, our taxpayers. All right, well, thank you. Um, first off, thank you to Joe. We are, you know, representing, I guess, management and labor for three decades. We have, we have done our dance and we'll always, the nature of this is we'll always have issues that we are working through. But the truth is the New York City fleet program, the 1400 mechanics is both, it's one of the great fleet programs in the world. Um, it's a testament, you know, I'm a permanent civil servant. I'm a manager, but I'm a permanent civil servant of 27 years. It's a great program. I've worked with city mechanics for my whole adult life. And, and so, you know, while we're going to discuss some issues here or there, I mean, it should be said, especially this year, you know, this has been an incredibly challenging year. COVID-19, we had actually service rates that were lower than ever before, despite these challenges. We did more preventive maintenance as tracked in the fleet system. We lost mechanics and supervisor mechanics who really gave their lives and, and you know, show that mechanics are first responders, including one of the my deputies at DCAS. This was not just the, the people in the garages, but one of my deputies also was one of the first city employees to lose his life to COVID. So we have all kind of been through this year. And so I, I do wanna just say, and I'm gonna answer every one of your questions, but the fleet program, the mechanics, is a terrific program. It's one of the great fleets. We're doing sustainability and safety and emergency response. And so 
so you know, I just want to say that up front and thank thank Joe and, and happy to to sit in here. And, and um, sorry for your loss. Um, thank you, and 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 also for we, and I won't go through all the names. I would not appropriate, but the number of city mechanics and supervisor mechanics um, who who have really um, you know sacrificed and their families have sacrificed. Um, so all right, so a little bit about the fleet program. First off, citywide we are mostly an in-house program. So that's that's. You know, we absolutely use some contracting and we're gonna discuss that, but it, it shouldn't go unsaid. We are mostly about 95%, I mean, 93 to 95% an in-house program. We have 1400 mechanics. We can always debate on the number of mechanics that we're allowed to hire. I've never refused the hiring of a mechanic, but I don't make those decisions. And I have to represent and, and argue a case to OMB and to the city. Um, and, and we try and do that, but that, that doesn't fall for me, with me. Um, and, and I will say, obviously, since the COVID situation, the city is in an attrition situation. That is, but we had been increasing uh, through fiscal year 20, we had been increasing the number of mechanical staff, not decreasing them. So in this administration through fiscal year 20, we had added 200 mechanical staff, supervised mechanics, mechanics, auto service workers. So, you know, we had not been in a reduction situation. We had been increasing. And the two and the contracts we're going to talk about have been around for a long time. Um, they are not new contracts in any way, shape, or form. Um, and, and some of them, at least one of them, went through the local law 35 process. Um, so where do we contract? All right. So we contract absolutely. And, and Joe mentioned the state ARI contract. DCAS uses that for the client fleet, um, and that's been used for it predates me, and I've been around for a long time. It's probably about 30 years now. Um, and that's for the 3,000 or so light duty vehicles that are out of all these small agencies. You know, not, not the big agencies, but small fleet agencies, right? So the Department of Buildings, the Office of Emergency Management, the Department of Labor Relations, City Council itself, we have, you know, might have anywhere from two to a few hundred vehicles. And, and they're an unusual dis disbursement because they, the offices are all in Lower Manhattan and downtown Brooklyn, but the vehicles are everywhere. So that program has, you know, I inherited it. I've been at DCAS 10 years. I inherited that. Um, that program uses the ARI contract. Um, there's no DCAS garage. And Joe might know. I believe there was a citywide garage, but it goes back. I, I think I was still living in Massachusetts back then. Um, and, and so that goes back at least 30 years. And so I've never seen it or heard. I, I know I've heard that one existed once, but we don't have that now. And I don't know that anyone's going to give us garage space in Lower Manhattan. Um, so we, but we do use city mechanics to inspect that work, to go into the quality issues that um, Joe Puglio had brought up and, and that can come up. We use city mechanics and we were able to, even in the last year, increase our inspection group. So we actually added a city mechanic. We traditionally, actually when I started this job, we had three mechanics. We now have five and we were able to add a city mechanic to that inspection group very recently. So. It is contracted, but it is also inspected by city mechanics. If there are quality issues, we're happy to take that up. We're doing, we're supervising repairs every day. Um, we actually have an additional mechanic doing that. And someone came over from the fire department and taken that role recently. Um, and we use, you know, Kelly Book and other standards to make sure that we're getting reasonable costs through the ARI, through the, the state contract. Um, then, and that's the decals contract. And we also have body shops, glass contracts. You know, we don't have a body shop. We don't have a glass, we don't have a garage. So. Um, then every agency, these are actually agency contracts, but under the general fleet rubric, every agency uses ARI as well. Um, and then agencies will have some of their own contracts. Parks has, has a, one set of fleet service contracts. Some agencies have fuel service contracts, other specialized equipment contracts. Um, and, and what, are, what are those used for? So those can be used for emergency situations where you need to scale up for a short period of time. After Sandy, we had some of that. During some of the real worst parts of COVID, we had some of that, right? At one point we were estimating about being only about 65% in-house fleet capacity because of illness and, and um, quarantine. So, you know, that becomes your emergency scale up. We do do special projects, and you mentioned those. Um, yeah, I'll give you one that, you know, it's part of the ARI budget. 
we needed to do hazmat cleaning of um, vehicles through COVID. And so through the ARI contract, it's actually an MWBE vendor who was referred by um, the commissioner of the mayor's office of peoples for disability. And they've been doing that hazmat cleaning and we've spent a lot of money on that because that's, but that's a very specific service. It's obviously we pray it's a time specific, um, but that's through the ARI service contract. Um, truck side guards were, were mostly done through, which is of course a one shot retrofit program mostly done through the ARI service program. And that's actually a lot of where the money, a lot of money went to that. But that had a dual purpose. We are, as you know, right, you know that program, we're also trying to create that industry, right? So we don't want just truck side guards for city vehicles. We want truck side guards on all vehicles. No one had ever heard of a truck side guard. So we've created the private sector industry that we hope now will be able to outfit private trucks all over the city, and there are a lot more of those. So those are kind of examples of projects that we do through outservicing, um, body shop, glass as well. So, you know, just to kind of sum up in this, most of our work is in-house. We have been increasing staff. Um, we do try and prioritize increases to specialty equipment, sanitation, fire, DOT just opened a new facility, this Bruno facility um, that, um, we are really still focusing on outfitting. Um, one other thing I will say, and, and, and Joe knows this as well, that it isn't about expertise. The city mechanics fix everything. That, that, we have no disagreement about that. But we, you know, there are issues of facilities, right? Facility projects are very involved, time consuming project. We just opened this new facility for the Department of Transportation out in Brooklyn. We still have a lot of outfitting to do from it. I've been working on that project for six, seven years, one garage. Um, and so we're, and of course the CRS is, has a whole big capital project for repairs, the main sanitation garage. So, you know, we try and prioritize on the most important investments. The most important investments where most of the work gets done is specialty and heavy equipment and emergency equipment in the city fleet. So, you know, light, light, we can talk about light duty cars and we maintain a lot of light duty cars, but light duty cars is not the bread and butter of this fleet. Um, some of these side, you know, side services like fuel site services are not the bread and butter of the fleet. The bread and butter of the fleet is heavy and specialized equipment and that is done in house. And that's where we try and focus hires and, and facilities. <laughs> okay, that was a lot. Sorry, Thank you. I, I remember the truck side guardrails, something that was important because we have a, a garbage dump in a residential neighborhood that uh, the mayor built and we wanted to make sure that- I, I am your neighbor in that neighborhood with two children, I know. Right, well, the, the, the purpose of side guards is to keep people from getting trapped under that. So uh, that, that was important. You, you preempted my question about why outsource that instead of just doing it in house. and. We do have legislation to require those side guards on all the commercial vehicles too. So it makes it harder for me to uh, argue against. So we're, we've heard from two labor leaders that vehicles are coming back from ARI contracts still in need of repair. If that happens, because right now folks, I, I feel on account, I don't know where I would report it. And if somebody's watching at home for one of Joe Colangelo's members, Joe Polio's members, if they get a vehicle back, um, where do they report that the vehicle wasn't fixed, that somebody just clipped the check engine light or what have you? Well, I mean, each agency has an agency fleet coordinator or fleet director who would be the point of contact for their agency. But we have the city mechanics who go to these shops. That's what they do. Like their full-time job is they live at those shops overseeing work. So if there are examples and we can follow up in, in terms of the park enforcement patrol, in the previous testimony, you can reach out to my office and we can go look into these. I mean, we keep five city mechanics. This is their job anyway, but we can absolutely look into these. We want, you know, these vendors, by the way, you know, the ARI network, and I think Joe brought this up. These are not big national chains. These are local businesses in New York City for the most part, right? These are not big Goliath chains that are doing the ARI state contract work. These are local businesses and, and the city mechanics who are or 246, local 246 members 
who work for DCAS. That's their job to inspect that work. And, and so we're happy to take up any issues that's part of what that's set up for. And, and look, we always have issues. Right? Fleet, the fleet repair business is issues every day, right? No one thanks you for, for a vehicle that works on any given day. They just have things they want that are broken and you need to fix them. So we're always dealing with service issues. That's what we do. Um, but we're happy to take up and, and look into any issue. And we, if a vendor doesn't do work properly, we won't pay them or we'll tell them to fix the work until we pay them or we'll get rid of them. I'm concerned that there's five mechanics doing oversight on the ARI contract. And it sounds like are those five also doing oversight on their on the other members to see if they did a good job or is it just on the ARI contracts and outsourced? Their main, their focus is the ARI servicing, but that is the majority, currently the DCAS client. That's most of what we do. And that's 1,400 light duty vehicles? Actually, 3,000 light duty vehicles. Is, is five mechanics enough to make sure that the repairs are, that are being outsourced are properly uh, being done? We we have a whole system. I it, it predated me here. I started with three mechanics in this role. We but like I said, we now have five. Obviously, we'll always take more, but we have to argue that case. I do think they're doing a good job. We we have a, a, a pretty involved system on how we inspect. You know, a lot of work, especially on light duty non-emergency vehicles, which is I mean, it's the Prius, right? You know, we have three thousand Priuses, so it, it's a lot of it's fairly standard work. Right. So, you know, if you're doing a tire replacement on a Prius or you're doing an oil change on a Prius, it's not, you know, this is not highly difficult to, to monitor. Um, the mechanics really spend a lot of time when we have more complex repairs, when we have any bill, any bill over 500, they have to inspect personally. Um, so I think we're doing a very good job. They're very committed. Um, they know what they're doing. Um, so we, we made, we just made an argument to get an additional mechanic and we got it. I, you know, I can always go back to the well, but these are tough times to. So, so, let, let me, so what does, what does that inspection entail? So anytime something goes out and it costs more than $500 to repair, it has to be inspected by one of these previously three, now five mechanics. Yeah, in person. So they will go get the estimate. They will go to the shop. I mean, it's anything over $500 and then anything we want. If, I mean, if there's some reason that a $200 repair we think needs to be looked at, we'll do it. But anything over 500, which is really, again, under 500 is going to be your tire. A tire replacement can be $200. Um, you know, a, a, a basic motor vehicle inspection is, is what, $35. Um, anything over $500, we get an estimate um, and we may get, we'll get multiple estimates from vendors. They will go inspect the work and inspect the estimate. Um, both before and after, and they approve it, or they approve it with our unit. They're essentially approving the work. Um, and how, then, how many vehicles are out on the ARI contract at any given point? Is it like ten, dozens, hundreds, thousands? It's it's dozens. Remember, while it's a large universe of vehicles, light duty vehicles have a much much lower out of service rate. It's a two percent out of service rate than heavy trucks, which can be at a 10 or 15%, right? There's much less that can go wrong on a Prius. And frankly, Priuses are very low maintenance vehicles. So it's dozens, not hundreds in any given day. I think the out of service might be 30 or so in any given day. So it is reasonable scale. And again, we did it for many, for most of my time at DCAS, we did it with three mechanics and now we have five. So we certainly have made progress. And maintenance of sanitation vehicles, uh, and emergency vehicles is not at all outsourced. It is 100% in-house. They use, I mean, it is almost all in-house, but they def both definitely use the ARI contract. They actually do that through their agencies. That is not through, I mean, it's a citywide contract, it's a state contract, but we do not oversee out of DCAS directly their use. And they use that for, you know, again, when they need excess capacity, if they have emergency situations, um, they'll use the ARI contract. Um, they, their supervisor mechanics or mechanics, usually it's supervisor mechanics, would inspect that work and be in charge for quality control on that work. It's always a union supervisor or union mechanic who's going to be overseeing that work. Uh, 
you mentioned that the ARI contract is particularly old and some of the other, oh, sorry. We heard testimony that um, when one tire needs replacement, four tires get replaced. Uh, are there systems in place that are tracking that and whether people are getting oil changes every time they come into the place versus every yeah. several thousand miles or that the tires are getting replaced too many times or taillights are getting replaced too many times? What kind of systems mm -hmm. do you have in place? With Again, we're, if, if you're replacing all four tires, it's gonna break the 500 mark and we're gonna be checking that. Generally, we replace one, you know, and we have our own, you know, we're taking OTPS cuts, right? So we don't want to replace tires that we don't need to. Our mechanic inspectors, that's their job to inspect that. Normally, you are not replacing all four tires unless you really have all, all four of them are, are worn. Or, you know, if three tires on a vehicle are worn, you might replace all four to, to ensure wheel balancing um, and, and to make sure you have a, you maintain a smooth ride. But but that's what the inspection process is for. Um, so just getting back to a previous question. So if somebody has something to report about a, a consulting contract, um, is there a hotline? Is there a number? Who do they call if they have a concern about particularly DCAS fleet? Or I, I don't know if there's a, a different number or if it's just called DOI. You mentioned a consulting contract. We don't use consultants. Sorry, so, whether it's the, the, the if there's a service, well, you can any anybody can always call DOI at any time for any purpose. That's their right and, and my right as well um, under law. Um, but if someone has a service you question, have a duty in many cases. Excuse me. You probably have a duty to report to DOI in many cases. I, I do, and I you know fleet keeps me very busy on the compliance side on all fronts staff management and contract. So I get I, I get I get that unfortunate pleasure on, on all on all fronts. Um, that said, if someone has a service question, whether it's involves DCAS directly or any agency, they can always reach out to my office. They can email nycfleet at dcas.nyc.gov. And if it's direct DCAS, we'll deal with it directly. If it's with one of our partner agencies, we'll coordinate with the fleet director of that agency, all of whom we work with daily and, and figure it out. Uh, if somebody's watching at home and has concerns about a, a whether it's a DCAS fleet contract or any city contract, uh, I'm a reporter, you can report to me. It's contracts at bencalos.com. You can also call Department of Investigations directly. Uh, they are 212-3-NYC-DOI for Department of Investigations. That number is 212 825-5959. You can find them on Google if you want to mail it in or otherwise try to submit uh, anonymously. Uh, just give me one moment. I think we are uh, wrapping up our questions for uh, DCAS. I want to thank you for uh, coming to answer the questions. I'm hoping that you can work with uh, President Colangelo and Local 246 uh, to, to insource that, that remaining five to 10 or perhaps more percent get those light duty vehicles in, in house as much as possible. Uh, I wanna thank uh, President Colangelo for coming in on such short notice uh, and really bring some things to our attention uh, and also his, his brothers and sisters at Parks. Uh, thank you to uh, Deputy Commissioner uh, Keith Kerman. Uh, this is gonna wrap up the uh, administrative portion and our, our labor portion. We are very lucky to have one last person testifying uh, his name is uh, Adam Roberts. He's here on behalf of uh, AIA. Um, I have only known Robert uh, Adam Roberts for only, almost 10 years. So I want to thank him for coming. For full disclosure, he, he was at one point on my staff, uh, but now he works with our brothers and sisters at the Architects. And we want to thank him for uh, coming to read testimony on their behalf. They had submitted it but we asked if they could read it. So folks on TV or on Zoom or live stream can uh, hear it for themselves. I'll now turn it over to uh, Adam Roberts. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, I'm Adam Roberts. I'm the Director of Policy for AI New York. Um, so I'm going to read a statement from our Board of Directors. Thank you, Chair Kalos and members of the Committee on Contracts for holding this hearing today. We are the American Institute of Architects New York, also known as AIA New York. 
Our over 5,500 members are New York City's architects and related professionals, many of whom are unionized city agency staff, as well as architects at firms that consult with the city. So Local Law 33 of 2011 was intended to curb the short-sighted policy of reducing the number of civil servant architects and other professionals at city agencies. And unfortunately, Local Law 33 has not succeeded in halting that trend. Furthermore, the continued diminishing of civil servants and city government has not succeeded in decreasing costs and hastening project delivery. The lack of qualified civil servants at agencies is one of the main causes of delayed and over budget public works. A lack of staff means a lack of project management, which delays projects and limits the ability of agencies to ensure contractors stay on budget. And this also limits competition for publicly bid projects since many architecture firms are reluctant to work with understaffed agencies. Smaller firms, which are disproportionately minority and women-owned business enterprises, MWBEs, are especially hesitant to take on city projects for this reason, while larger firms can take the financial risk of working on delayed and poorly supervised projects, MWBEs often do not have the ability to do so. And not only should the city do a more effective job of enforcing Local Law 33, but it must go further to ensure agencies are well staffed. In 2019, the City Council passed Local Law 97, also known as the Climate Mobilization Act, a landmark piece of legislation requiring large buildings to stay under emissions limits by undergoing retrofitting. Unfortunately, the Department of Buildings has funding for only a handful of staff to oversee this law, which will make it difficult to enforce. A failure to effectively enforce Local Law 97 will cost architects, engineers, tradespeople, and others billions of dollars in expected income, while depriving the city of desperately needed revenue and taxes and filing fees. If the city is to keep projects on time and on budget, and if the city seeks to enforce ambitious legislation, it must have the staff necessary to do so. Thank you again for holding this important hearing. Uh, thank you uh, to AIA for testifying on behalf of its members. Uh, I think your testimony says it for itself, but just to be clear, would your members be able to move projects more quickly if there were more uh, employees and civil servants and architects on the city side? Absolutely. And that is one of the uh, main complaints from architects who consult with the city is there aren't actually enough of their colleagues on the city side to help them move a project forward. So, so just to be clear, an organization, I know you represent folks on both sides, but uh, as a representative for folks who are doing consulting contracts who are, are getting this outsourced works, those getting it are actually asking for more city employees to be hired uh, and, and even for there to be some more insourcing of some of that work. Absolutely. They, they strongly feel that way. And especially uh, as we said in our statement, MWBE firms really need the help on the inside. They, for you know, not just architecture, but in other industries in general, uh, they tend to be smaller businesses and they don't have the benefit of, the, of being able to take on projects that get delayed, projects that don't have proper project management. They need people in the city advocating for them and helping them. This is a major reason why the city often fails to reach its MWBE goals, at least in design and construction. Thank you very much for your patience. Um, thank you for delivering the testimony. Uh, I don't think anyone would believe it unless they, they heard it here first. So I really appreciate it. I really appreciate that AIA is uh, fighting for the taxpayers and for our city. So thank you for joining us. Uh, do we have any other people signed up to testify? Uh, seeing none. I would like to thank everyone for participating, our brothers and sisters in labor, AIA, the administration, and I hereby adjourn this meeting of the uh, contracts.